Hello, welcome to this incredible Square Bay show, because this is our first ever Faction Deep Dive. Today we're going to be covering Orcs and Goblins in detail, in depth, and in discussion. Welcome to the Square Bay show. Do you hear that, Rob? What is it? It's a deep dive! It's a deep dive, Rob! <laughs> Gets me every time. It gets me every time. I can't. I say only that. twice. We've only done it twice. Yeah, I have two uh, two phrases that live rent free in my head now. It's deep dive, uh, which I say <laughs> I say just at the. I'm like, oh, I've got to go find this thing. Let's deep dive it. Uh, and then also, <laughs> if I see any of my friends, I'm like, oh, it's Elisa Al Gahib, uh, which is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dune and deep diving live rent free in my head. Hello to everyone watching this video. Leave comments, like, and subscribe. Uh, we are going to be covering the orcs and goblins army roster uh which oh is fun and this is our first deep dive so uh, yes. i'm going to say at the top of the show i'm not 100 percent certain what this looks like so i would like you all to leave comments things you think we could do better for future videos do that right now well do that once you've watched the video but i'm going to prefix this now and just shout out no no well. just do what do what half of all youtube commenters do just go with how you feel the title and the thumbnails made you feel just, just, just make <laughs> a comment based video. on that well they're already watch not the watching video. this section so they're already not here so the only people seeing this are actively watching uh which is fun, that's okay so. but actually i would say that 50 percent of your average youtube commenter probably five to ten percent of a square base commenter all right guys you guys yeah, are good you guys, you guys are good out there you guys are the best also you rob want to point out they said it couldn't be done but i'm wearing a green shirt on a green screen Congratulations. Congratulations. I don't I don't know if you want me to flex. We're not meant to be doing this this early, but I don't know if you see what happens what, when you look look at Wait, what are you flexing? Oh, oh yes, your limited edition shirt. So does that mean that you have the blanket? No. So uh for Valentine's Day, I bought because my girlfriend designed the old world map. Uh, or yes. was the one of the people working part of the team who designed the old world Perfect. map. Uh and so I bought her the box as a present. Uh, but I also got the hoodie as an extra large for me. So nice. So there we go, which is fun. So yeah, she got that, and then she's got the old world blanket now up at home on the wall, which is cool. It's a nice little thing. That's fun. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, so yeah, I got that, which is fun. Anyway, anyway, uh, also goblins. Okay, right, deep dive. Let's talk about how we're going to break this down. I think this is going to be really important. Other right. shows, other shows, <laughs> would just other go shows. through. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll just go through every single unit. And I think we'll probably touch on every unit. I think that would make a lot of sense. But yeah, I think some... some at least. Gotta give them a little, hey, how are you? Can't we just, do. Can't... I mean, this is a deep dive, Rob. Deep, deep dive. But I think maybe because we this isn't something where we don't know what's inside the book. This is, this is a review in post. And obviously, people have had discussions. So what this is more be is kind of like a, a general idea and strategy session about the book itself. We're going to go through, mm -hmm. especially some of the key items like magic items and stuff like that. But then we're going to talk about the units and more about army concepts because me and Val kind of touched on this when we did like a, a, a chat once and I think that's mm -hmm. well, that makes a lot of sense like if we were covering ogres versus this we'd be like okay you're just all big guys okay so like what are you going to lean to lean into in that situation whereas in this big guys the big guys and this is quite interesting there's quite a lot of like uh units that are in a similar role you know like night goblins and goblins uh orc <sighs> boys black orcs you know, they are mm -hmm. similar roles. Uh, you got like different cav, but it's the same cav. So I think mm -hmm. going through them each line by line feels a little bit superfluous. So we're going to try and cover them uh, in sections, I think. So, yeah. and, and, and I would say that I'm going to challenge myself here because I'm going to be very tempted. Uh, to Yeah, we don't, we don't want to go all in on, oh, this is good and this is bad. Uh, but there are, there are some units in this army list that have downsides and there are some units that don't have downsides um and by that i mean like impetuous i'm talking about impetuous that's all i'm talking about so, <laughs> okay chat so, i'm gonna need i gonna, gonna if you're watching this as a commenter or like on youtube it's a podcast or in the chat i just need an impetuous count from val yeah okay we need an impetuous counter or at least a val is obviously trying not to shit on a unit because it has impetuous counter because <laughs> Uh, impetuous for those at home means that uh, if you are within your charge range of an enemy unit and you uh, and you enter your, your strategy phase, you got to roll and on a four up, I think 
Well, either on a four up, you don't charge or on a four up, you have to charge. It's 50, 50. You got to charge whatever you're in range of. And there's mm-hmm. no way to mitigate it except for with black orcs. Um, you know, like, uh, so it's, it's there's a, no way um, to mitigate, there's no way to mitigate it. Like rules wise, there are physical ways to mitigate it. You could physically, yeah, sorry. There, you can physically mitigate it, mitigate it, which makes sense if your impetuous unit is say, I don't know, some, 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 you know, the, 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 the dragon Princess. guys from, yeah. From dragon princes from high elves, and they're like your your heavy elite cavalry. But uh, base of snotlings, some goblin wolf riders, like dudes who do not want to be necessarily charging off, and you want to control them because they're supposed to be controlling the board. Anyway, we're getting into it already, but impetuousness is is tricky and something that I personally, when playing this army, have not even uh, bothered with. I have not I have not tried a lot of the impetuous stuff. So. I, think that, I could get myself into a situation here, Rob. Big war, big disclaimer, where I am looking past things, and maybe that's what this deep dog will help us discover. I'm looking past things because of impetuousness um, and uh, and snobbishness, snobbishness on my part against impetuous units. Well, I don't, I don't think there's anything bad in just kind of like rounding this off. And don't forget, a lot of this is also opinion. Whenever I do these for like other game systems, what I generally tend to do is, is a do I think a unit is good? Yeah, or do I think a unit can be good and can be good can be good is like a little bit like i guess in that situation you consider them to be bad but i don't really think you can really have bad units in the old world you can have points in efficient units but everything has a role so really it's about what it does in the role and if there's something that's better in the role or different in the role um and that's not because i'm just always a positive person no one's ever accused me of that it's just because Mm -hmm. like the game has got like more facets to it than than people think and also i've been more you know i've it, it takes time these things take time to learn. We're all still learning. That's the important part. Also, I will counterpoint something to versus myself. So a lot of the things uh, that are impetuous in this list, obviously, are infantry units, right? So uh, an infantry unit's charge range is going to be its movement plus six, uh, which is about 10 inches. So that does give you a fair amount of play on the board if you want to use them as uh, you know, redirectors or screening units. Um, that still gives you a fair amount of play to get up close to where you want to be and, you know, get being in position before you're in a situation where you have to charge off the, what, the ones where it's a little bit more tricky to deal with, um, is things like, um, you know, uh, obviously cavalry units where you have in a lot of cases, swift stride, things that are going to extend that charge range and make them a little more difficult to control when you don't want them charging off chariots. Um, so, um, yeah, so we'll we'll take a look at things as we as we go. Okay, yeah. So well, let's jump off with this, the first point because I think the first point is maybe the most important point that defines this roster. If you're thinking about playing orcs and goblins, you are going to be dealing with impetuousness. Uh, as mm-hmm. Val said, most of the units are impetuous, which means they're going to potentially charge off, uh, and this becomes more of a problem. Like Val said, if you have faster units. However, the book has its way of dealing with this uh, in the Quell Impetuosity Special Rule. Whilst within yep. six inches of a unit with this special rule, friendly units may choose to ignore the Impetuous Special Rule. And this Quell Impetuosity, if I'm not mistaken, can be located on Black Orc Bosses, and Black mm-hmm. Orcs, the unit. Uh, yeah, exactly. So you got your, your Lord level, your hero level uh, bosses, and then the unit itself, uh, which is cool, especially from the unit. So like the Black Orc unit itself, you could, uh, if you were very obsessed with this, you could string it out a little bit to give yourself a very large bubble of, of uh, lacking in impetuousness. Um, so there are ways to, to deal with it that way, and that also gives you a Black Orc unit on the table. Yeah, and there's also like a kind of follow up to this uh, in that if you do end up with either a Black Hawk unit or a Black Hawk boss, you have to then have the other. So if I've got, I, I want to mm-hmm. take some Black Orcs, I've got to have a Black Orc boss. I want a Black Orc yep. boss, I have to have some Black Orcs. So Correct. this is kind of an interesting, The f- I think this is the first thing that we should discuss because this is going to define your list because you like yep. straight off the straight off the bat, you're going to be saying to yourself, okay, Am I going for Black Orc boss and Black Orcs? And Black Orcs aren't super cheap, neither, neither is the boss. And therefore, what am I going to do? What's been so far your decisions on this process? How have you felt about it? What do you think? Because um, it shocked me that you, I haven't seen you. It shocked me that the list we saw from Umir, uh, which did well at the event, didn't have a Black Orc boss or any Black Orcs. And uh, I haven't seen you run any Orcs. Yeah, and I was like... Any orcs. It well, had an Orc war boss. It had an Orc war boss. Uh, which uh, I do believe is also impetuous. 
Um, he is. Unlike the Black Ark War Boss. Um, so to me, I think this is like the first decision tree. Uh, that, but however, I will also point out that it was a Night Goblin list. Night Goblins, for whatever reason, are immune. They, they don't carry the Impetuous uh, USR. Um, uh, which is, uh, with the exception of, uh, the, the squig herds. Um, so, um, the, whether or not to black orc is probably your first question, uh, that you're going to be faced with, with yourself. Cause you might want to have, uh, some, uh, just, uh you're going to want to go ahead. Sorry, no, you carry on. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm just picturing, just picturing an old world player holding a black orc egg, like to black orc or not to black orc. Yeah. <laughs> that is pressure. the question. <laughs> Um, but it truly is because the second you do go to that black orc, and the best lord character, like as far as the combat and um, you know output is concerned, is definitely the black black orc war boss. He is superior, I think, so good. to the, the re- regular war, bo- war boss. Mm. Um, which then precludes that you must have a unit of of black orcs in your in your army, which count towards core, which is nice as well. Um, so it does immediately take you down a certain direction um, that you know. You, you have to decide whether or not that's something you want to lead into because having the black orcs does give you unlock some very great tools for the rest of the army list. Uh, but it does feel like it's going to sort of direct people more and more towards having uh, sort of a black orc centric army because it does provide, I mean, two of the best unit entries period, the, the, the black orc war boss and the, uh, and, and the, the, um, uh, the uh, Black Orc boss, like so, like the sort of the lower level character, also very good. Um, and then the unit itself, Black Orcs are very good. So, like, there's no reason to be mad about this other than I'm already feeling like I kind of feel like I have to go this way. Um, so, like, chafing against this is is your first decision point. It's like, do I want to have these guys? Because if you do, then that's sort of where your 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 list starts and builds out from from there. Yeah, and I think it's worth pointing out now because this is when I think we should just look at this unit it kind of in of itself, yeah, uh, and like, and then we'll talk about because at each decision point, I think we can kind of like break into the units versus just going through them line by line. But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I mean, the Black Hawk War Boss, if you go for the Lord Level One, I think is very competitively priced, one hundred thirty five points. I think he's mm-hmm. great. Toughness five, three wounds. Uh, which is really, really nice, toughness five. Strength five, wild. Weapon skill seven, wild. Four attacks, mm-hmm. awesome. Leadership nine in a pretty low big. leadership army. Uh, leadership army, sorry, big. It starts at full plate. Like, what's not to love? Yeah, uh, can be very important. Uh, very importantly, can be on a wyvern. So it can be on a uh, uh, a big, big mount that, uh, you know, gives you fly, gives you uh, extra toughness and wounds. Um, and kind of a useless profile other than that, but uh, the, the Wyvern is, you know, definitely b- boost this guy up because then he has an 18-inch um, uh, inspiring range bubble. Um, so having, having whether it's your Black Orc War Boss or a regular War Boss on, on the Wyvern really, really helps, makes him be able to zoom around and solve a lot of problems. Um, uh, the other great thing about Black Orcs is they come with Furious Charge, so that gives him plus one attack on the charge, so... Looks like he only has four attacks. Actually, you know, if he is getting the charge off, he's getting five attacks on that. Um, and then also has the Quell Impetuosity rule. Um, so it's uh, it's a pretty, pretty good package here for 135. Now, can we do a direct comparison to the the uh, the regular War Boss? Sure. Uh, the regular War Boss is like 25 points cheaper, 110. Uh, and then uh, his still strength and toughness five, one lower weapon skill is the main major issue. Um, major like, issue actually leadership eight i would say leadership eight yeah okay fine leadership eight is yeah. the, the issue because this is like the top right this is like he doesn't have i don't think he has oh he does have warband so he does have warband yep. so you could potentially put that up to leadership 10 that's not too bad mm-hmm. like yeah that's not too bad but so, he's impetuous he is impetuous however if you want to go with the cheaper war boss that you could then put into a unit that's also war band that would actually get him up to leadership 10 uh that's pretty cool uh because that's so now you have a very strong um you know leadership core to your army because war band obviously adds uh leadership points uh based on how many ranks are in the unit um that that he's joined to um so that's uh pretty awesome um, he also does have Fur- Furious Charge, which is cool. Um, one thing to note is actually Black Arcs don't have Warband. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that, that comes in, uh, in, into play. 
Uh, Warband also gives him reroll charges. So if he's on um, if he's on a on a mount, I think he gets the reroll charge. I don't know if he needs to be in a unit in order to get the reroll charge. I, I'd have to double check that. Um, so there are some some you know still some pros to to the orc orc boss, but um, going with the orc boss uh, in a unit, let's say you're not mounting him on a wyvern, I can see the orc boss war boss being a good option because that lets you go to the black orc. Uh, boss instead of the war boss uh, who could then be your battle standard bearer yep. um, and who can go into a unit with the the regular orc war boss uh, provide them impetu like a, 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 a ignores impetuosity uh, situation you can mount those two guys onto some um, on, onto some um, boars uh, which is a very strong unit um, and then you still have that other unit of black orcs to maybe be, be the center block in your army and also quelling impetuosity to the units around them. Um, so there, so there you go. There's a decision tree that you can go, you go the big boss, make them your BSB, maybe mount them and, and package them with a regular war boss. And that's going to make your war boss better. And, you know, you got a different way that you can build still with black orcs, but not like, you know, when you have that black orc on, on Wyvern, um, it's very like. I don't know. It's it's a higher concentration of points. It's definitely like a, a big direction you're going with your army. Yeah, I think that's I think that's that's would be my first port of call. So I think that's really well articulated. Like, am I going to be hot? Because we you got to talk about tempo. Because when you're writing an old world list, you already have a plan. Like, if I'm taking no stone throwers, no doom divers, I'm going forward. Okay, right. But if I'm going forward with infantry blocks, like Val says, my charge range is 10. That's it. But if I'm mm -hmm. facing against all cavalry, they're charging me first. So what am mm -hmm. I putting in my list that's stopping them from hitting my important stuff so I can counter charge? You already are making all these decisions before you even put a model into a list. And sure, you can just write, I like the things that's cool, Rob. I'm going to do that. And that's super okay. That's really, really valid. But what I like about the old world is that there's some really... Um, even if you're aiming to have fun, some of these really simple concepts are really going to help you um, put something on the table that's going to feel more like an army that has play versus mm -hmm. not. And and one of the my favorite elements about that is both of the two bosses have ignore goblin panic because mm -hmm. goblins like uh, goblins unlike other units in other armies aren't going to immediately cause panic if they end up breaking around your army so there's that narrative kind of aspect that's l really telling you by the way you can just take some chaff in front of your expensive orcs because these don't care these guys so that's, a, yeah. that's an important factor which i think is quite fun um okay so before we talk about the rest of the kind of the uh the units uh and the things so i think that's that feels like the major decision tree in this army. And there are like, you know, you could go orcs, you can go goblins, you can go night goblins. I think we'll come back to that. But I think yeah. before we start talking about characters and probably the next most important thing is wizards. We haven't like, we, this is our first time. First time we've done a deep dive. So I think, yeah, good start. Wizards next. But before wizards, I think it's worth looking at items. Um, Sure. Yeah, I'd love to look at items. Let's do it. Um. Items and any other big special rules. Quell impetuosity is probably the most important one. The rest of them are kind of like core rule book special rules. Well, so um, some of them like like Du Bois, uh, Biggins, Choppers. They or they're all uh, like actually. When yeah, I let's did go the... have a look at but US. Let's do US Let's go see because uh, okay. actually, um, uh, uh, Big Guns is is kind of interesting when we're looking at uh, some of the other uh, orc units like a uh, um, like we talk about the Boar Boys. Um, or even just regular boys uh, gives you a, a modifier to your strength characteristic and armor bane. Um, that's particularly awesome. Um, I for think on, on regular boys, yeah, for biggins, yes. So yeah. it's an upgrade, and we'll we'll, we'll touch on it later. Chop is a super huge. It's super huge. Yeah. Um, basically, it gives you uh, better AP and uh, reroll wounds of a natural one uh, in turns that you've charged, and that's a. Uh, Basically, all anything that's an orc, like an orc model that doesn't have magical weapons, has choppers, which actually raises a question when you're like upgrading your lord level characters or your hero level characters. Do you keep the choppers rule or do you give them a magic weapon? Um, that's that's a um, that's an interesting. Especially when they're at strength uh, five, like you're like it's yeah. kind of okay. That's not bad. It's super all right. Um, that's all right. And then. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, interesting thing, all goblins fear elves. Um, that's oh, an sorry, interesting can we just, one. Can we just don't go worry. Back, can we go back to the mm-hmm. Biggins Choppers uh, kind of conversation for a moment? Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. when I did the overview of this, I was like, this is telling you you need to fight. That's what it's telling you. It's not saying you get to reroll ones in shooting. It's not giving you any bonuses to that. This is saying, by the way, fight. Go fight, and here's some Boy. bonuses. Yeah, here's some bonuses for fighting. But specifically, these these are only attributed to orcs. So, like, um, which is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, these aren't, like, a big universal overarching rule that's applying to, like, most of the units that you find in an army. This is, if you're taking orcs, these are going to apply. If you're not taking orcs, this is just not, means nothing to you. So I, I think this doesn't necessarily define the army. They're just elements if you're playing orc heavy versus something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I always look like in almost all of the rule sets, like, choppers tend to get some sort of a special benefit. Uh, and this one is, I think, particularly awesome, especially because it's not like... If, on big guns, for example, they get armor bane, and a lot of times you will see that instead of an extra pip of AP, you'll see a bonus given to you as armor bane, like the Razor Standard now, which is a generic uh, banner you can take from the, the rule book, gives you armor bane 2. It used to give you negative 2 to your AP, so that's taken away. So the fact that you actually get a full extra pip of AP on just your regular ass troops pretty phenomenal um and uh you know even better when like they're black orcs with great weapons now they're minus three in the turn they charge pretty crazy yeah i think also like we probably should like there's an entire conversation we could have probably in another show about initiative um because really is your army actually a fighting army because if its initiative is so low it's not unless it's getting charges off unless it's doing other stuff uh which again mm-hmm. talks about the tempo of the army uh yeah but you were gonna say fear elves uh for goblins uh, like which is an issue I guess there's an issue, but no one, I mean, I've still, uh, to my benefit or, or detriment, uh, I just never remember to test for fear. So unless <laughs> you have an elvish player as a stickler, this won't be a problem. Um, <laughs> cheat. What we're saying is just cheat, right? Like a true well, goblin. Okay. Yes. Cheat a little, but <laughs> whatever. How I, I, the, the less cheaty way to actually describe this is fear uh, is mostly impactful when you are outnumbered. So if, as long as your uh, unit strength is higher than the thing that you're fearing, you don't have to check, if I recall that correctly. Um, and goblins are generally speaking, like goblins that I care about are going to be in blocks of infantry usually. Um, so this also is another reason why it hasn't come up is because they haven't been in situations where they would have to test. Um, terror obviously is a different story. Agreed. Yeah, Terror is really good. Uh, then Ignore Goblin Panic is in here, which is good. Again, this is mainly going to affect you if you're orcs. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. an important part. Um, you've got Ignore Panic, uh, which is just Ignore Panic, which is good. It's a nice bonus. Like whenever I see stuff like this, like immune psychology, Ignore Panic, I'm like, this is all great stuff in yeah. the right ignore, situation. Ignore, ignore Panic is the upgraded Ignore Goblin Panic. So this is the Black Orc rule. So they just don't give a shit about anybody freaking out. Um, again, Black Orcs are just a very, very excellent anvil anchor unit, sort of center line type core unit of infantry. Um, so it's it's pretty fantastic. We talked about Quell Impetuosity, Tusker Charge. Um, again, this is something that makes um, boar boys and war boars um, particularly good. Uh, gives you a strength and, again, armor piercing bonus uh, when you charge, and that gives is given to the mount, mm. uh, which is pretty fun. Um, something that I found super useful, uh, even on my mounted uh, Black Orc War Boss, is the Wasp special rule, um, because it's going to let you reroll natural hits of one and give you a plus one combat result point. So, you know, if that first time I'm going into combat and I maybe need a little edge uh, with my uh, my big mounted uh, War Boss, uh, Black Orc War Boss. I declare a why, even if it's just him, because it's, he doesn't have a, a unit with him. It's fantastic. Yeah, so, so this is a once per game ability. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the interesting points, when I read this, someone like me, when I read this, I go, cool, I'm doing exactly what you've done. Like, what, I'm going to add a little bit of punch, or I'm going to build around this. This is where mm-hmm. I'm going to orchestrate stuff on the board, the perfect setup, where a unit that I've tooled out with banners, heroes, other stuff 
is going to then go blend. That's their job. like, Or at least it's going to help them do a blendy style job. And the real question is, is whether or not that's something that you're going to be able to orchestrate on the tabletop. Yours is like a much easier kind of through line. You know, it's just a bonus you get on addition. It's like a nice bit of flavor. But this is definitely something mm-hmm. you could build into, which again, I think is one of those decision tree points. You look at this and you think, okay, I'm going to build a superstar unit that's going to use this to do some really mm-hmm. effective stuff. Uh, and I think there's there's the, pos- the possibility there. Not necessarily certain you want to do all of that machination, but some people will definitely love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then finally, Warpaid. This is the thing that defines, uh, along with Frenzy, uh, the Savage Orcs uh, or the the Bone Splitter models from AOS. Um, they don't. They're not named in the army anymore, but they are represented by their special rules, and it basically gives a six up ward. Um, however, it almost always comes with having frenzy and uh, uh, an inability to take any light armor. So that's sort of the sort of the trade off there. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit torn at the minute, like about armor and armor values generally for all the different armies. So I'd love some feedback mm. from uh, people in the comments, chat, all those other things about how they feel. When I've been doing the army overviews, <sighs> if I see just light armor on something, I'm like, whatever, like no save. That's just how I think about it. I just think no save. So only when you start yeah. getting up to full plate and shield, do I really start to give a shit. Like to be honest, yes. that's like and, and for right, me, even heavy armor and shield, like four up, definitely. Um, you know, because that's probably going to be a five up, which is still worth worth having. Um, I, I would say, see, so yeah, if if you can get to a heavy armor and shield, that's 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 worth talking about. Um, but I mean, for for example, one of the places where I shaved just some tiny points off of in my army is. Uh, originally I had my squig hoppers. We'll see they have the ability to have light armor, um, no shield. So they were just on a six up and there's five points per unit. And I was like, why am I paying five points per unit here? I'm just going to, they're just going to, the same difference to not have any armor. Um, so I, I just took it off. Um, so I think, I think that is a interesting decision point. We're like the big, big gr- groups of infantry that can do like light armor and shield. I guess sometimes that's probably not a bad idea, but I guess we'll go case by case on that one. Yeah, I think it's I do think it's a case by case situation. And I think things like six up ward saves are like really just nothing burger to even discuss, unless you start talking about lots of models. And then it yes. actually is really, really interesting. Um, but this is because this is just something that's common across all game systems. So it's mm-hmm. not like uh, but I I like I'm kind of a little bit more pushy. I think full plate shield and then I'll start talking. Like I think even the four plus it's a five up. Like I don't know. Like I want so if I want something, if I'm spending points i want them to survive and mm. even a five up i'm not really vi- vibing on that as as i like, pushing towards survivability but anyway i think everyone's gonna make those choices and that's much harder to find all right so magic items we're gonna talk about these now mm-hmm. it's gonna be fun and some of their uses and some of them are silly and some of them might be really useful and then we'll look at some units so uh i, was for, I love i love the idea of the first one Okay, first one is the Battle Axe of the Last Big War. Uh, wow. And, wow, 75 points. So obviously Lord Heroes, uh, Lord level characters are taking up 100 points of stuff. And this mm-hmm. is strength plus two. So this on our big bosses, it's going to be strength seven. Uh, AP two, extra attacks plus D6. Mm-hmm. Magical attacks requires two hands and strikes last. And note, yep. if a natural six is rolled for the extra attack six, the Battle Axe of the Last Big War loses the extra attacks D6 special rule at the end of the current combat phase so you can have one big six um or multiple others you like this tell me about this i want to like this i'm not gonna lie to you um the problem is is that it strikes last and well first of all I mean, the biggest problem is obvious it's 75 points uh i think this is a by the way i think this is a fun arm i think this is just so much fun that like you could just take this and not care too much and just and feel cool that you have the biggest axe <laughs> in the world um, it's model but the it, one. just just the big I, well the the old plastic war boss model does have a big fuck you axe so I mean it, it works really well with that um, but I mean you strike last um, and you only have twenty five points for for magical items we're gonna get to probably the best item in this whole list which and there are a bunch of good ones uh, but that's the troll hide trousers uh, which is a forty point um, magical armor upgrade um, that you're probably always want, gonna want to take on your important character so. You're not able to do that. You're not probably able to get to a really nice level of innate toughness with this. It requires two hands. You can't use a, a shield. So that means he's getting beat up before he can actually swing with this giant awesome axe. Um, you can't take a ward save on this. So that's all the play. 75 points just feels a little bit too girthy 
I would have loved to see this at 60 points because then you could have fit, fit some of the defense in. Aside from all that, though, very orky, nice, flavorful, flavorful touch. Gets you up to, what do we say, 11 attacks then? Mm. Like if it's on a black orc on the charge, up to 11 attacks, assuming he gets to swing at strength 7 minus 2 AP. I mean, that's a lot of fun. That's, that's fun. fun. That's fun. The, um, uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of thoughts here that maybe we should like touch on before we go any deeper. Is that like when you're thinking about building units uh, and characters in the game, are you building them to kill stuff and generate combat resolution through yes. murder, or are you looking to generate combat resolution through like rank bonuses <laughs> and, and pluses? And can we can we on. create a very very uh, serious and, and erudite uh, book? Uh, Titled "Generating Combat Res Through Murder." <laughs> <laughs> Mother, by, by, by doctors Havelfinger and Simon. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Please right. make me that graphic. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, so, <laughs> you got to think about if you're doing it via murder uh, or if you're doing it obviously uh, via combat res. And in addition to Val's point, like, so you're getting points by killing units, which is why combat resolution is important. But you're also mm -hmm. saving points by saving units. So again, like like Val saying, I, he wants his stuff to stay alive, obviously because it can yep. do more murder if it's alive. But also, mm -hmm. he's saving points. already pretty good at murder. Already, like just baseline, pretty good at murder. Even if you don't have a single thing on them, exactly. Uh, orcs are pretty good at murder. So, uh, so I think are they good I, at living? Yeah, they're good at living. I guess that's a, that's a great point. That's why Empire is so boring right now. They do none of the things. No murder, no <laughs> living. Uh, <laughs> all right, next one is Porco's pig sticker, which is forty points. Uh, it's strength plus one, AP one, uh, it's armor bane one, and it's magical attacks. And it's got a note, models who stripped out cavalry monster or chariot only. Weapon strength and armor piercing modif modifiers apply only during the first round of combat. In addition, mm -hmm. in a turn in which the wielder charges, uh, grants some plus one attack for each rank the enemy unit has. So yeah. you, can, you can get a lot of extra attacks, but it's a charging weapon. I'm a little bit cautious of those at the minute because I feel units can get trapped in combat a bit. Yeah, I mean, this is going to go on a you know a, a unit that's, that's mounted, obviously. So, I mean, ideally, they're getting the charge off, you know. Um, and uh, this is what I've I've thought about a few times, uh, but but also like I'm not I haven't been running the War Boys Cavalry um, unit Rock. at all yet. Um, so, as a result, uh, this hasn't been something that's really fit into my um, thinking. Also, got to think too meta wise how many big multi-rank units are out there that you're going to be want to be charging into with your heavy cav. Um, it's, it's a question mark. Again, I think this is a fun and cool item. Unlike the, the, the big friggin' ax though, it's not always going to work. So if you want to do something that's fun, I got to go big ax. Um, again, it's not the best choice, but at least it's fun. This, I think there's, there's lots of times where you're just not really going to get much benefit from it. Um, and uh, and so I probably would pass. I agree. Uh, the choppiest chopper, uh, strength plus one, uh, AP three, magical attacks. Uh, I think there's something we should always mention about magic magical attacks. Ethereal exists. Uh, mm -hmm, the ability sure to does. stop ethereal is nice, um, and it's only thirty five points. Fine, it's this fine. Is, I think hands down the best magic weapon they got. Um, you know, throwing it on your uh, you know your war boss or your black orc war boss gives them strength six minus three AP and magical attacks. Um, you don't get the choppers rule anymore, but that's okay. You've got negative three P innately. Um, you know, this at 35 points compares very nicely to the, I think, sort of swiftness, maybe I can't remember. Anyway, in the in the in the main rule block, it's it's one of my favorite magic weapons in there, which is just plus one strength, plus one, sorry, minus one AP magical attacks. So for 15 extra points, you get another two pips of, of negative AP. Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, AKA, very, very good. And also <laughs> cheap because, like, it's, it's, you can now afford armor as well, right? Which is kind of, I think, I think yeah. the key point. And then you got Wallopers One Hit Wonder. It's <laughs> a lot of fun. Which is Strength 10, AP3, Magic Attacks, and Strike First. So you'll be swinging at Initiative 10. And then Goblin and Knight, Goblin Bosses only. You can use it once. And once per game during the round, uh, sorry, the first round of combat, the wielder this weapon yeah. uses profile. At all other times, this weapon counts as a hand weapon with a magical attack special rule. And while this is really fun, 
being strength 10 and AP3. Uh, mm-hmm. Goblins and Night Goblins not got the most attacks in the world. So, uh, Well, actually, on the bosses, they're base 3, and then if it's a Night Goblin War boss, base 4 attacks uh, okay. at weapon skill 4 or 5. So, like, they're not chumps. Um, and so it's not... It's not super awful. I like one of the first things everyone started doing, I think, right out of the gates is putting this on a, a guy on a giant cave squig, letting him run around and wallop something once as as a one off. For me, I think actually this this is used best as um if you're running night gobos and you have a BSB, for example, you know, it's maybe the cheapest BSB in the game. It, it's 55 points just to have the guy. Um, and so that's a fantastic value on him. But you know, do you really want to invest a lot into trying to keep him alive? He's toughness four. He's got two wounds. Probably not. Walp is one hit wonder, though. Uh, would maybe give him an extra round if he gets challenged out, um, or if he's just in base in, in base to base with with things that are you know able to, able to to hit him first and also probably kill him. So you don't necessarily have to invest in armor. Might buy him an extra round of combat um, and uh, keep him on the table a little bit more. So I, I view this as a nice maybe little defensive weapon. Uh, that you can tack on if you have the points. Uh, I had to drop it, though, out of my list once I upgraded to the choppiest choppa. Um, and uh, so I, I no longer have wallop as one hit one on my list, despite loving it. So It's a very fun item. And this is, this is what I mean about uh, items or units that aren't necessarily like, this is the best fit or best in slot. But this is like absolutely gear your army around this. Like you could be doing a lot of machinations. And this is what I mean about narrative gaming as well. Like if you get really, really good at a game, you can build armies that are just really trying to do fun stuff for you. And this Mm -hmm. is absolutely a fun stuff for you situation where you can, like you say, Put, a, put it on a, a, a goblin with a cave squig, run around, make yourself do some really fun stuff, uh, and then you know really change the shape of the game. I'm actually, I think I've also missed, I may have sold Wallop as one hit one to short. I read this as once per game during the first round of combat, meaning it has to be used uh, the first time you're in combat. But actually, reading this full sentence, I think it can go the other way. Once per game during the first round of combat, the wielder of this weapon can use it with the profile. Yeah, with this profile. So you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to 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 use it up necessarily. Okay, that makes it even even better. Again, I love Wallop as one hit wonder. I think it's great. Uh, I'm really disappointed that it can't be taken on a uh, night goblin um, odd knob or odd git um, who who are their casters because this would be. By far the best weapon to use with a uh, spectral doppelganger. Um, check it out. Check out what that one does. Basically, allows you to use um, a uh, uh, your basically it's it's a uh, in combat spell that allows you to use whatever weapon you have, um, except you get two d six hits with it. Uh, so this would have been sick like that. But obviously they caught that because they made it they made it only night goblin uh, bosses. Uh, so yeah, way to go, playtesters. Well done, playtesters, for the immediate <laughs> jump. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's look at some magic art items. And your first one, troll hide trousers, maybe worn with other armor. Um, is it worth? Do you think right now bringing up the conversation about armor, armor types, or should we wait for FAQs for that? Because like uh, you know, I, I, armors I of kind. So yeah, so we actually, be fairly neither. I think. Oh, so the heavy armor. So uh, if you, depending on how you read the the, the core rules, essentially magic armor um, will often describe, for example, armor of Mark. Mark is a suit of heavy armor, uh, and if you read the rules around who can take what, uh, when you read magic armor in the core rule book, it seems to suggest that you can only take types of armor that you are able to equip. So if your model is allowed to take heavy armor you would be allowed to take the armor of Mork. Um, If you uh, have plate or light armor as options, you would not. Um, I think that's a very tight reading of that, and it's part of me is also, I'm kind of wishing that that is not the way it is, but you do see evidence in how um, magic items are are made and constructed and available in certain lists, uh, or not available, and the way things are worded elsewhere that supports the idea that, yeah, literally, if you don't have the option to bring heavy armor, you can't bring things that magical armor that aren't heavy or like Troll Hot Trousers aren't a specific type of armor. So you see, you'll see things like helms, um, you'll see trousers, I guess. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> and then, uh, but the, but it also extends to things like shields. So if you're not allowed to take a shield, you're not allowed to like if you don't have the op- option to equip a shield, you can't take a magic shield. So it feels kind of restrictive in that interpretation. Think, yeah, in that interpretation, I don't think it's. I don't think it's a crazy interpretation. I don't want it to be the right right interpretation, personally. Uh, but like you said, I th- hopefully that does get clarified if it's not blatantly obvious already. Something to keep in mind. Um, but I don't know necessarily if everyone caught it because it is kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, but if we can jump into Troll Hat Trousers... Yeah, maybe we'll win other armor. So it's just... It doesn't worry about other armor. That's why I brought it up. Where the Troll Hat Trousers improves the armor value by one. Just a nice, thick pair of knickers and gives you uh regeneration five plus wow. i would have loved so desperately if um if wizards could take this because they're just pants it would have been great if 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 wizards could take this and give I themselves a little bit of why a lot of the orcs and goblin roster is unpanted yeah yes yeah definitely and uh ungenital um because <laughs> they are fungoids of color um the armor of mork um, is a oh, can suit we just of touch armor. On, sorry, oh. can I just touch on troll hide trousers? Because like, there's oh. something actually massively important there. I, obviously, getting regeneration is insanely good. Like, mm-hmm. It's an additional ward save, effectively. Uh, but the plus one armor save outside of the normal like tree of developing armor saves is an amazing like Big addition. Time. Oh yeah, it's sorry. amazing. Like any magic items or anything in the game that's going to add plus one to your save. That's outside of shields and armor values and armored hide yeah. and barding is a, yep. already just like a value item. I would say in most cases, massively so. So I mean, to put this into perspective, you put this on your black orc on a wyvern uh, who already has full plate and a shield, probably. Um, so is sitting on a three up uh, now can get down to a two up. So that's yeah. pretty good. That's why well. um, you know so, you know your mounted uh, guys often get two ups, um, or just your regular ass uh, you know war boss on foot can now get down to the three up, uh, who doesn't have uh, plate armor. So really good, pretty good. good. Really pretty good. good. Before you get to the regeneration, regeneration's almost I feel like a like an insane bonus. Like regen's regen's so strong right now because it, it used to be undone by flaming attacks. That's not the case anymore. Uh, in case you missed that. Uh, regen uh, is only turned off by flaming attacks if you're also flammable. Otherwise, you just always get it. Um, and um, it's, so it's very, very good. It is a you know slight tier below a ward save. Um, so if you consider that this is getting you plus one to your armor save and essentially giving you a five up um, uh, ward in most cases, and that the uh, you know was a talisman of preservation or whatever, which is a five up ward, is 30 points i mean this right here this is this is a jam and it's uh, a common magic item as well so you can take this as many times as you want throughout your army whoa i did not notice that that's nuts that's nuts Dig it, oh, yeah. yes <laughs> okay all right also goblin players just literally putting their trousers on this is is this bootstraps <laughs> is that what are, you, are they doing that are they pulling themselves up by their bootstraps uh anyway well, they, look orcs and goblins just put their their trousers they're on one leg at a time just like everyone else except theirs is made out of a, a dead troll oh, which the, is great because they're also in the army i think that's a bit if I was a big dumb troll and I saw someone wearing my friend as their pants, you know, I might listen to them more. <laughs> Mother! Uh, right. <laughs> uh, right, anyway, the armor of Orc, 30 points, the uh, suit of heavy armor. In addition, it's uh, wearer has magic res 2. So, character's got magic res 2. I join a unit. The whole unit gains magic res 2. Uh, so, right. this is a, this is an item not to be slept on. Yeah. Right? And... And and the the reason why is if you're doing um, just the regular uh, common magic item, which is the I can't remember the exact name for them, uh, but the, basically you can do uh, minus one magic resistance for twenty points. You can stack it so you can get up to minus three for sixty points. But obviously this is ten points cheaper, and it's a suit of heavy armor um, for for magic resistance too. So this is very good to have on an orc boss. Um, you know, uh, maybe may, again, very good thing for a BSB, like an orc boss BSB, um, to be just chilling in a unit with magic res negative two, because that is that kind of magic defense, super important, um, especially for any unit that your opponent. That if you think you have a problem unit, whether that's like a, a like a flyer or a you know the brick of black orcs or a brick of biggins or whatever you decide to go with, if you think this is going to be a problem for my opponent, 
<laughs> your opponent's going to agree with you, and they're yeah. going to target it with as much magic as they can. Yeah. And uh, magic res is a double whammy because it's re- it's making the um, it's making it harder to cast and also lowering the value of the cast, making it easier to dispel. Mm. So magic resistance is actually a double negative to um, to your opponent. It's harder for them to cast it and then easier for you to dispel. So magic res is something that, especially because I'm almost, I'm certain magic is going to be very dominant in the in any game that you play, whether it's in the broader meta or you just with your pals. Magic resistance on important units very important. Armor more great way to access some magic resistance. Yeah, I think I think your point is is really excellent. I think that's probably just a good tip for list building worldwide. Is you're building a superstar unit, a killer unit that's going to get targeted by those wizards. What's your way of dealing with that? It can't just be a straight roll off. You can't try and win those games with my level further versus your level four. And obviously, if you can really help your unit out, that's, that's a really good point. I think. Uh, okay. Something something I realized too is like a lot of the best spells uh, are high casting value, and yes. so a high casting value means that you have to, you know, you, you not only have to to dispel it, you got to be plus one above that. So like to, for example, dispel. Uh, Miasmic Mirage, um, you know, that goes off on an 11. So, you know, if you're a level four caster, you need a seven to get that off. Numbers change significantly when you're dispelling uh, with a le- even a level four casters. You need an eight plus to get that up, to, to stop it. Mm. Um, so, like, you are you go from being odds, like, it, it basically has a 60 something, I think it's about a 60% chance of casting it uh, for on offense. It's a, like a 40 something percent chance of stopping it. But if you were to then reduce that to a 10, now you need a six. Uh, on your dice, you're you're into maybe the seventy percent chance of stopping it. That's massive. Um, so it's it's uh, and it was harder for them to get it off in the first place. So anyway, um, it's it's really really good and uh, a very good way of, of of protecting those important things. Yeah, I agree. All right, so talk about protection Talis- talismans. Uh, we've got the glowy green amulet. If the bearer and the unit they've joined is the target of an enemy spell, they may use the glowy green amulet instead of making a wizardly dispel attempt. Uh, two plus dispel is dispelled. However, if one is rolled. It explodes, the amulet is destroyed, and the bearer loses a wound. So, same like you said, big big spell protection here. This is this is this has been in my list. I took it out of my list, and then after taking it out and realizing that thing about like spe- the best spells are hard to dispel on two d six. Um, uh, this made it back in. So this is carried by my BSB, uh, my my little night goblin BSB attached to the black orcs, and it's strictly there to just try and stop um you know those those big debuffs or damage usually debuffs actually or damage spells that are coming in at that unit um the issue is that it's a very orky weapon a uh, very orky item so that two up uh, the first time i've only ever actually rolled on this once in the games all the games i've played and i of course rolled the one um so uh Perfect. i i it's uh it's one of those things where it may just never come up that it blows up for you that you just always stick the two up um, and it could be one of those things that you just never get to dispel anything. Um, but it's, uh, I think for 35 points, really good. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic item and should be considered in just about any army. I think also like, like even the opportunity cost of it is like for 35 points is arguably better. Like if you have your big brick of whatever it might be, and I'm mm-hmm. your enemy, and I can cast a spell to shut down a unit or reduce some stats on a unit. Am I going to choose the unit that's got a two up against it, or am I going to just pick the other unit? So I'm probably just going to pick the other unit, like with no hope, or you know, maybe I'll spam enough stuff at you at, a, at that unit to try to make you proc the one, potentially. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, like I have to make that decision, and causing a problem for your opponent in decision making is key because then they're more likely to make the wrong decision, like which is great. And, and as the as the user of this, like my brain is like, do you just always roll because yellow? Like, do you just always roll because like any roll can be a one, and any roll cannot be a one. Yeah. Um. You know, like it's an eighteen percent chance that this thing craps out. So like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the right answer is for using it. Um. Because it's a bit of a gambler's fa- fallacy to say uh, that you know the more use of it, like anyway. Regardless, I think I just always roll with it. I don't know. 
Um, it stresses me out. The glowing green amulet genuinely stresses me out. <laughs> uh, when I, <laughs> uh, but but it is very good and could be devastating to someone who like even like for example, if I came against the glowing green amulet uh, with my army that keys off of like very powerful magic abilities, I'd be like, oh 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 no, like that would be bad. That would be very. I would not want to see glowing green amulet against me. Uh, so it's stressful for both sides. Perfect. Um, the the perfect item, uh, as I've said many times, the perfect game is when no one's having fun. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, no um, one's happy. Uh, the, no, everyone's having fun, but no one's happy. Uh, the collar of Zorga, twenty points, an enemy uh, beast of burden that directs attacks against the wearer of the collar of Zorga or their unit during the combat phase suffers a minus one hit roll. The purpose is rule. A beast of burden is the amount of any model whose troop type was. Oh, I'm already stopped reading. Uh, yeah, can we if this was on? five points, if this was five points, it'd be great. You put it on your dragon guy, and he gets a little protection against other dragons. Cool. Uh, it's twenty points. Screw that. Get out of here. Get out of here, caller Zorga. You suck. Whoever you are. Now I. Think... Tab- and by the way, I think the, so far our only true dud, uh, like truly untakeable item, um, is the caller of Zorga. So we're doing great. That is good. Now I, I would say ma- uh, magic standards are what I like to call a force multiplier in many ways. Sometimes mm-hmm. I think it's okay to say that you might even build armies around certain magic standards. So mm-hmm. these are one of those things I would say that are fairly important in the decision tree. Maybe not something to come to later, uh, but maybe to look at early if you're looking through army stuff. So the first one is the big red raggedy flag. Beautiful. <laughs> a unit carrying my this. Favorite, my, hold on, my favorite flavor text, which is this tattered banner belonged to the great hero Rowdy Porker, whose spirit imbues <laughs> it to this day. Pull one out for Rowdy Porker. Rowdy uh, Porker. Rowdy Porker. Uh, the third blues brother. Okay. A unit, <laughs> <laughs> it's my nickname in college. Yeah. A unit carrying the big red, uh, red raggedy flag as a plus one modifier to its weapon skill characteristic to a maximum of 10. In addition, when calculating its combat result, the unit may claim an additional bonus of plus one combat result. Obviously, incredibly important uh, this situation, for both offensively and defensively. So this this is in my army list um, on my on my unit of black orcs, and I will point out that all of their magical standards are fifty points and below, which means that on the units that can take them, and I think I think one of the orc boys units can take a, a standard up to fifty points as well, can take them. Taking standards, magic standards on the unit standard as opposed to a BSB is a lovely piece of tech because it can't be targeted out of your unit. So if you bring the big red raggedy flag uh, and your unit's you know, getting beat up, you're getting that plus one weapon skill and plus one combat result point until the second last model is dead in that unit because the standard bearer is the second last thing to be, re- be removed for, as a casualty. So all of these things, when you can take a magic standard, can be taken on the unit itself, and that makes them very, very good and strong. The big red raggedy flag, I mean, what more? Uh, I mean, it gives you... T- Two buffs for 50 points. It's fantastic. Love it. No, no questions asked. It's great. Yeah, I think it's great as well. Uh, wild Banner, 40 points. Unit carrying this Wild Banner increases its maximum possible charge range by three inches. And when it makes a charge roll, it must apply plus D3 modifier. Now, this is obviously really important because inventory is so slow. But also, in addition, if you do want uh, one of your cavalry units to be that much faster, also another cheeky bonus. Mm-hmm. So it really, mm-hmm. like, do you want to help a shortcoming? Like, you know, improve a weakness or do you want to like lean into a strength is the kind mm-hmm. of real point here. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I'm just trying to think of like units that I really want this on badly. And th- th- it seems like a really good thing. Like it, it seems like just at first blush really good. But again, like the units that I really want to make their charge at longer ranges probably are already pretty good. They got swift stride. Do I need to make them a little bit better for 40 more points? Probably not. I don't think. Mm. Um, whereas like the blocks of infantry and stuff, again, that three inch charge range is nice. Cause it's going to let you, well, especially when you're squaring off against other infantry, uh, you know, their charge range is going to be very similar to your charge range. Um, so that gives you that little edge, but you know, what types of units, uh, when we're going through things, maybe it's worth thinking about what types of units would really benefit from that extra little little juice, because odds are you're taking the charges infantry, um, unless you're, you know, winning the chaff game in other ways. Um, so, and also, most most blocks of infantry, aside from Black Orcs in this army, have Warband, which allows them to reroll charges anyway. 
giving them effectively a better charge range because you know you can reroll short like failed ones. Um, so anyway, this, forty this points feels the, a little steep. The the reroll charges plus though the extended range and modifier though yeah. do, does mean that you can like you know almost fish for a bigger roll. But I think your point about like your one for one against another unit cavalry or you know or infantry and you now have a better threat range I think is good, but. Probably in most cases, I'm going to be trying to develop other units inside of my list that are controlling the board state, so I'm getting charges off and my opponent isn't, which is kind of the sure. quintessential element of the game, right, I would say. Uh, okay. I mean, you look at, I mean, again, compare it against the Raggedy Flag, always good. Every, yeah. ra- every, every round of combat, you're getting plus one weapon skill, you're getting, you're getting uh, and plus one combat res, all, literally always good. You know, the Wah Banner, there's a chance it gets the opportunity to be good with that gets taken away, and it's 40 points. Yeah, I'd say the Wah Banner um, is a skill issue, is what it is. Mm-hmm. Don't take it. Be better. <laughs> to Banner <laughs> and Butchery is 35 points. All models in the unit carrying this banner have a plus one modified to their strength characteristic during the turn in which they charged. Obviously, this is great. I think that's great on like a unit of, uh, you know, Boar Boys or something that's, that's, that's you know, definitely going to reach out and touch. 35 points. Yeah, I think it's, it's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really, really good. And then Guff's Windy Banner, uh, they reroll any failed panic tests. Not bad, actually. Like, not bad. Not super bad. Um, uh, almost, to be that. honest with you, uh, panic is not a, also is also not bad. If you're above <laughs> if you're above half your unit strength, it allows you to do a fallback in good order and reform, uh, allowing you to change you know from skirmish to open order or open order to skirmish. You know, it allows you to. Um, you know, get into a big wide line if that if you feel like you're about to get dusted. So like panic often ain't, ain't too bad. Um, but again, for 20 points, why not? Why not? Agreed. Okay, last couple of ones. So we've got enchanted items now. We've got 50 points, got the big boss at during com <laughs> the command sub phase. Character in the big boss at is not engaged in uh, combat, may treat their comrades some inspiring words by making leadership test. And if this test is passed until starting next turn sub phase, this character and any unit they have joined gains the unbreakable special rule. Just from the off, for me personally, it's a leadership test. I'm not in combat, so it's situational when I can use it. And then I have a pass the test to use it. So it's a big... A and big it's one turn? And yeah. it's one use only? Uh, it's not one use oh, no. only. No, okay, that's nice. It, okay. But you can't use it while you're in combat. So I'm like, okay, the time I want to use it is this yeah. is now. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to um, say no. And 50 points. Uh, probably no. But I don't know. Maybe there's something you could key off of it with like a giant brick. If you got like a huge brick. But those guys, generally speaking, aren't going very far if they lose either. Um, but yeah. So I think probably overpointed for what you get. Agreed. A button at is only 15 points, loads of ats. Uh, and a button at gives away it impact hits one special rule. The impact hits has armor piercing characteristic of two. That's two. Fine. Whatever. Yeah, it's fine. A button at, especially like you put that on one of your wyvern guys, if you had the 15 points or whatever, gives them a. Um, I think they only have stomps, they don't have impact hits. So, I mean, I mean that'd be a strength. Oh, no, it's the wearer. Anyway. Uh, it's not the worst. Fifteen points, I think. Uh, you know, if you're looking to round it out, why not? Yeah, just and it's a common magic item, so just take twelve and just keep running at people. Uh, uh, like, would that stack? That would stack, wouldn't it? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, if you put if you put multiple Ed Button hats on yourself, if you if you put a hat on your hat, would that not? St- I believe that might stack. I have to check. Worth that. looking into, guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking of multiple characters with their button hats. Literally, just like a bunch of just Ed Button goblins. Um. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You could have a front row of just Ed Button goblins, <laughs> or you could have a strength five, negative two AP. Uh, how many can we fit on a one guy? Uh, forty-five would be three, so six. Six impact hits, negative two, strength five. On like your your like war boss on a boar, okay, I love that. That's good. Maybe I, I think if it's in bracket, I don't know if it stacks. I, that, we'd have to look at it. Or I mean, again, even if it's just one for fifteen points, not bad either. Yeah. Okay. And the fungus wine. Uh, also, something you can throw on. You can throw on at, at fifteen points. You'd be able to throw it on the uh, unit champion in in like a, a tusker charge. Sorry, in, in like a boar boys unit. Um, you know, so again, just a, a thing that you can use. Um, oh yeah, this is nice on a unit champion. I think in the right units, mm-hmm. this is really nice. That's a good point. 
Uh, okay, and the next one is Fungus Wine. Again, a common magical item. Uh, Night Goblin characters only, single use during the command, some phase of the turn. If they're not engaged in combat, the character may attempt to distribute the Fungus Wine. If they do, they've got to pass a leadership test, and if the test is passed to a deck start turn sub phase, this character and any unit they've joined gains the Immune to Psychology special rule, which feels not bad. Terror's an issue, right? For low leadership units. True, yeah. I mean, you still got to pass the test. Um yeah, I, I, I it's fine. I've, I've every time I look at it, I just I keep keep looking. I don't, th- and it's also like you're in a game. You have to be in a game situation where you're like looking around. And you're like, okay, next turn, I need to be immune to psychology. I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily I would have the skill to actually make use of those ten points. I'd rather I'd rather find something more fun to use to get. But maybe it's a piece of tech that would be useful to somebody. Yeah, I think it's also situational, right? Like, at what point yeah. do you want to be immune to psychology? So, yeah. Okay, so arcane items, you've got the glittering whatnots. If the bearer is the target of an enemy spell, they may use the glittering whatnot instead of making a wizardly dispel. Or on D6 and 1 to 3, the whatnots have no effect. On a 4, the spell is reflected back at the caster, and their unit becomes the target of the spell. The caster <laughs> may make a wizardly dispel attempt. This is absolutely 11 out of 10 as an item. Huge fan. <laughs> it's pretty cool um it's 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 a cool one um but you know i think i like i would rather you know i I like my um uh the the glowy green amulet as far as defense is concerned however this is kind of cool also i just love the idea of just like a an orc shaman just being like just like (laughs) reflecting it back (laughs) so good uh, which is pretty cool um but again, I think that, I think these magic items are also highlighting how much more magical defense there are is baked into the game than there is magical offense. Yeah. There's, uh, we're about to see the only uh, you know offensively boosting item uh, that there is. Uh, so again, there's multiple ways to mitigate magic if it gets out of control, uh, less so otherwise. I think, uh, uh, but clearing whatnots is pretty cool. I think I prefer this to the two plus. I think I math wise, I understand the two plus is more effective. Um, but two plus, I just stop it. Four plus on this, you also you were also on the receiving end of it. That feels pretty destructive long term. Doesn't go away, you know. Like I can't lose it. It's constant. It's a uh, it's an issue for you all the time. Uh, I like I w- it. I, I would say that this is the a rare use case for a level one wizard. Um, Interesting choice. Yeah. So like so you you put this because you probably don't want this on you know, like one of your high-level casters who are good at dispelling anyway, and who are going to want a different arcane item. They're going to want lore, uh, lore familiar or the next two that we're about to look at. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, just like a little punk goblin, again, just hanging out in a unit with this on them. Um, that could, that could, that's got play to me. That, that seems fun. Yeah, I agree. And good. Yeah, good, yeah. And then what? Uh, so then we've got Buzzgob's Nobly Staff. This is obviously makes a lot of sense. Once per turn, the bearer of Buzzgob's Nobly Staff may re-roll a casting roll. Okay, just a just insanely good, just straight up good. Um, and uh, this is what I take on my illusion uh, Night Goblin because again, a lot of those key illusion spells are pretty high casting value. Just gives me uh, an, an opportunity to get you know my Azric Mirage or the Crystal Column off, um, and uh, is uh, delightful and impressive. Yeah, it's also the math on it is really, really, really good. Like pluses to cast are excellent, but you like you, the game has built in pluses to cast, so mm-hmm. that isn't anywhere near as effective as a reroll. Um, so like the math on that is also that it's just much more significant than like an another another plus one to cast is nowhere near as good as this because yeah. this game, like you've said. Uh, like this game will be defined by those quintess. It's not quite as effective as like a, as a purple sun was back in the day, but the right <laughs> spell at the right time is game changing. And if you can re-roll that one, uh, that's good. And you normally set do a lot of positioning to set up a spell, so get in a position where you don't. Anyway, next one is Isla Moor. I'm gonna. I was a kid. Isla right, Moor. Where were we? Thirty points. All right. The bearer of the Isla Moor increased their dispel range by three inches. Ooh. Additionally, once per turn, when attempting a wizard dispel, the bearer may reroll the dispel roll. Wow, that's amazing. Yep, is a good one. Yep, is very good. Um, can't. I don't know. I can't. Can't front on it for sure. Um, it's good. Uh, that's all I can say about it. I've taken it a number of times. It's very good. I did. I traded this for like basically I traded glowy green amulet out to pick this up. Um, I went, I've gone back to the glowy green amulet though, because I wanted I wanted defense on a specific unit. 
Um, and I wanted it to be like just definitely work, except for that one in six times it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't work again on those high casting value things. It's still hard, even with a reroll, to roll you know like an eight or a nine plus. So anyway, uh, it's uh, it's a great item. I think all three of these items have play, um, and uh, the orcs in general have great magic items. Yeah, so one of the things that like I'm kind of picking up from this, like you know, similar with the the the, the universal special rules, is now it like very much feels like I can very heavily lean into magic into the army if I want to. Uh, so oh, yeah. you know, like so we're already at this like several decision trees now where orcs, black orcs, and then now we're going big magics. If I, on that point, can we scroll up to the uh, unit roster, like mm -hmm. the actual roster? Because this is a very special thing about orcs and goblins. Yeah. Which, uh, go for it. Uh, so the reason what is special is that uh, if you look here, uh, like all armies, 50% of uh, your army's points uh, value may be spent on, usually it's zero to one uh, of a lord level, like fighting combat hero. So that's your black orc war boss. And your orc war boss, or an orc weird knob, which is your level four caster. So generally speaking, you are forced to either have one le level four caster and like a big beat sticky guy on a dragon or something, or two level four casters, or some high elves might have double dragon, whatever. Uh, however, uh, you don't have to have that choice in the orcs and gobbos army. You can in fact have two um, black orc war bosses on wyverns, and then level fours in your. Uh, <laughs> Goblin sh shamans and your night goblin shamans, uh, because goblin casters um, are able to be level fours and not subject to the zero to one per one thousand point restriction. They're just as good, in fact, probably a little bit better, because uh, they have access to the uh, uh, lore of Mork rather than lore of Gork, which has itchy nuisance as the signature spell that you, they have access to, which gives you a minus d three to your initiative and toughness on a target unit. Uh, not in combat, but um, nonetheless, incredibly powerful debuff spell. Um, so yeah, orcs and goblins, probably the strongest magical army, um, just based on this. They can they can literally bring a ton of level fours and their best uh, combat characters as well. Yeah, and I mean, if you really wanted to lean into it, because again, that's one of the really fun elements of, of the old world specifically is that I like in army list construction is you can just create a problem your opponent wasn't expecting. Like, I'm not sure how many level fours we could take, but the answer is a lot. Like, the, <laughs> the answer, answer is indeed a lot. The answer is a lot. And sure, fast units are going to charge into your front lines and wipe out a ton of those very weak, weak, undefended goblin casters, and you're going to give up a lot of points. But you're going to have a couple of turns of some outrageous magic. And, like, that might be the tipping point your opponent was not expecting, which I quite like. And I think that like, that's another decision tree for people. Like, even just sitting here right now, and this is, I think, probably where Peter the Falcon went with his original list, but I'm just sitting here thinking, like, why aren't I running two Black Orc War Brosses on Wyvern and then two, <laughs> two level fours? Because uh, right now, I'm wearing, one, of my, uh, one of my casters is an Orc Shaman on, on, a, on a Wyvern. I do really like that, that loadout. Um, but, you know, basically, those two Orc War Bosses on Wyverns are going to be equal maybe to the cost of a chaos dragon, like the bit really tricked out chaos dragons and stuff like that. Mm. But you're getting a ton more wounds. So you're getting like, you're getting more quantity than quality uh, compared to those guys. And then suddenly that makes a lot of sense. And also if one of them dies, it's half the amount of points. So there's, there's an argument to be made, I think for that, like to really lean into that, the opportunity to take two Lord level um, combat characters and magic, if you wish um, kind of interesting. Yeah, I think I think a decision tree definitely. If you build it into this army, is it, it, I mean, this is going to be true for this is a universal thing as well, right? Which we'll see in every deep dive. We'll end up like, and by the way, you haven't said impetuous for ages, so great work for you. Uh, we, haven't been, but, we haven't been talking about units yet. <laughs> now, this is about, we're about to get on that impetuous train. Look out! <laughs> but uh, yeah, one of the things I would say is is like again, decision tree because as soon as you do, because you do black orc boss on a wyvern, you're then doing black orcs as well. And sure, you can take really small minimum units of black orcs as, as attacks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do like the wizard list. Now I want to write the wizard list and see just what how much I can punk out in wizards across the board. Not necessarily certain you even need the combat characters. Like, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But there's a, there's a version where you don't, right? 
Yeah. Um, well, the well here. Why don't we? Why don't we start looking at uh, the the magical uh, characters? Yeah. Okay. We'll do straight in there. Okay. So we've got uh, the couple of we've got the orc shaman. We've got weird knobs and the weird boys is what we've got. Uh, mm-hmm. And then obviously you can level one to level two, level three to level four, um, and then you've got battle magic, elementalism, and war magic. Uh, you've got access to here and the lore of gork and the lore of gork. So yeah, that's right. Pretty interesting, and that what what I really like about the weird knob is tough as five. It's great. Yeah, out of nowhere, right? Yeah, it's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Um, uh, leadership eight, toughness five, one forty. So you're looking at one seventy. Yeah, one seventy to get um, up to the level four caster. I mean, not bad. And access to some really good lores, battle magic, elementalism, wa magic. I mean, my favorite at this point in time is elementalism. But you really can't go wrong with those battle three lords. Like, just, like yeah. all like Wa Magic is also really good. Like it's it's just a tremendously solid lore. Like from top to bottom, it buffs um, it buffs your um, your army really nicely. There's a lot of area of effect spells. There's a lot of self uh, spells, which means you're always going to get to cast them. Um, there's like there's some really great like uh, like there's Vindictive Glare, which is a fantastic magic missile. Um, so like wall magic's solid. Like you're not dumb to take wall magic. Um, elementalism might have some like slightly better like tools in it uh, that I like more as far as like tech is concerned. But again, you're not a dummy to take wall magic by any stretch. And the same goes for battle magic. Battle magic's got fireball. It's got um, uh, the, uh, the the movement spell uh, arcane urgency. Um, it's got a, probably one of the best vort- vortexes, vortices, the um, the fire one, which allows you to so choose good. which direction it goes. So good. Uh, strength, uh, little uh, small template, strength three, min- uh, strength three minus two AP does not. It's not bullshit at all. So anyway, big big awesome choices available to orc shamans, and at a pretty normal points level, I feel like that's a pretty standard caster points. Points cost one seventy. Yeah, they are. Like, so, like Chaos Sorcerer Lord, which I think is kind of like like a go to wizard to look at because that kind of moves towards the top end where they've got an inbuilt ward save in, and they have an armor save, an inbuilt ward save. So you're like, mm. okay, right, that's really silly. And then kind of like some of the army books are kind of odd. Like there's no there's no upgrades here which are in addition. So like obviously with the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, you can take Chaos Mutations and you can take Magic Items. You know, if you're looking at Wood Elves, you can take you know wood spites and also magic items so some armies have got the ability to really double stack on some characters which is why i think mm-hmm. that they're you know more problematic necessarily inside the meta but obviously that you're spending more points but you know doubling down on something tend to make sense survivability is where i always find when you move away from those sorts of characters chaos Sorcerer lord you then are like okay what am i doing in the survivability aspect for wizards because i think this is kind of interesting as well obviously they can also be mounted uh can they be mounted these guys yeah it can be mounted oh heck yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so i run mine on a wyvern for example so, so like can we talk so, about that for a moment so can sure. we talk about mounted characters mounted wizards and putting wizards inside units because i think generally wizards inside units are weaker source than uh, a wizard just that's running around doing its thing depending on the situation exactly and i think actually the orc shaman presents us with a really enticing uh situation to decide should i should he be in a unit or not because we haven't touched on his special rule uh which he does have not quite it's not quite zinch but uh mob rule uh, gives him a plus one to cast, basically. So if the character is joined at a unit of orcs with a unit strength of 10 or more, they may apply a plus one modifier to any casting roll they make. Should they leave the unit for any reason, they lose it, blah, blah, blah. Now, um, that means that an orc shaman in a unit of, I don't know, 20 skirmishing uh, error boys or something um, is now effectively a level five wizard, um, which is pretty dope. Like, that's very potent, very powerful. Who maybe can reroll um, to cast. And- who could maybe reroll to cast? Um, so and might if they're in a skirmish unit because you're allowed. We'll see later. You're allowed to take one unit of orc boys in a skirmish formation. Would have a 360 degree view of uh, like vision arc with either battle magic or elementalism or even wa magic. That's really good, right? So like the, I I would generally speaking agree with you, Rob. You don't want your casters in bunkers anymore because it's much easier to hide lone characters these days. You just got to be near a unit of the same type and uh, by, by that I mean within three inches 
um, and they can't be targeted. Um, and then if they do happen to roll snake eyes and miscast and they, you know, detonate or whatever, that strength 10 ball on top of them isn't killing that entire unit that they're with. Um, and they've really not given up much at all with, with regards to um, being defensible. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really good, uh, uh, I, I think it's a really good thing to keep them outside of units. Yeah, well, so this is, uh, I've said in the other show, that this is why I've gone and picked up a, a manticore uh, to put my Chaos Sorcerer mm-hmm. Lord on top of, uh, because drawing line of sight is easier, mobility is is easier, um, and ultimately, once you get locked in combat, most of, like, it, it, like if you're building your wizard as a gun platform, or even as a support role, Almost all of the time, they're better if they're not locked in combat. Now, obviously, yeah. there's some like there's some cases where that's not the case. Some spells and some spells can be done in combat, so it's a case by case choice. But I would argue yeah, it's, very, it's very narrow band, though. That are like very narrow band of. I mean, chaos is probably an example where you might have a combat wizard, but in general, you do not want your casters in combat. No, like you know, and like a manticore's kick ass or a dragon, even you know, like that will do a job of doing all of the casting for you. Like, sorry, all the combat yep. for you while you do the casting. Uh, but like, I do, I think we're going to end up in a situation very much like your goblin on a carpet. Um, we're going to see lots and lots of flying mounted wizards generally inside the game because you just end up being able to be a wizard more effectively. Yes. Uh, so something, I think- something important. Something important too about that mobility is staying, like staying. So, so even if you if you're good yourself when you're in combat as a wizard, like you maybe you got some good, uh, uh, you know, combat uh, spells. Maybe you got uh, uh, target uh, like range self spells, so they can be cast in in, in combat. Maybe some of this is explicit that you can cast in combat. That's all great, but you always lose the ability to dispel. So being being in combat rem- probably is removing your number one defense against other magic. Uh, and generally speaking, it's a lose condition, I think, is having casters, especially casters that you don't have a really good plan for. Um, you know, it, being in combat is bad. Um, having them on the large target, though, so I'm not, I assume a mana core is a large target. Yeah. A wyvern, wyvern certainly is, means that they can see over their own units. Now, other, other things can see them too, but now their toughness six. Um, he's got a five up save because of the wyvern. Uh, and you can, you know, add a ward save if you if you wish. Um, and so for me, I like to have Ruby Ring of, R- Ruby Ring of Ruin on this guy on a wyvern sitting behind my lines with whatever they've rolled up. Hopefully, they also get a magic missile in elementalism. There's wind blast, which is awesome. Um, you know, and the Ruby Ring. They're basically my gun platform, just punking guys from behind the lines. And there's usually too many other things as well going on that they I haven't so far had the fact that he can also be targeted be a big deal particularly and if there's something that I'm very afraid of well he's got he's got a 9 inch fly move so he can he can just get the hell out of there you know he can go behind a, a forest or you know get behind a hill or do whatever he needs to do to 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 get out of range of whatever thing is threatening them um and the same thing goes you alluded to the the magic carpet which would work on an orc shaman just as well as it does on a night goblin Gives them the tremendous range, mobility, ability to get around and be def- and defend themselves by not being where trouble is. Um, so the wyvern is 130 points. A lot of people say, "Why would you spend all that on a guy who's never going to be in combat?" Well, the wyvern kind of sucks as a combat mount anyway, mm. um, and we'll see that in a, in a second. Uh, but it gives so many other benefits and extra wounds. I think another additional three or four wounds. I can't remember. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, I really, really like the weird knob shaman on a wyvern. Yeah, I think one of the things also, to, a question I want to throw out to you listening at home, you ask yourself how many points you would spend to be able to just consistently at least attempt to like dispel your enemy spells. Like there's like, mm-hmm. which is effectively what we're talking about. Like it requires a little bit more movement, but I think that, that is a key, key element. If you know, early doors, you get locked into combat. Also, one of the things about having a wizard that is either like on an independent flying mount uh, on some sort of mount on their own, running around uh, mm-hmm. that isn't locked into a unit means that they could be supportive of an army that's more mobile. Like if you end mm-hmm. up with an army that's very fast, that's trying to really engage in their, the enemy really fast, then you're going to want uh, something to keep up with that army because spell range, like the spell ranges are quite interesting because generally they're between 18 and 24, generally. Uh, but then mm-hmm. also your level four is unbinding at that range as well. And then vortexes mm-hmm. are a real issue if your opponent starts putting them out before you get in range. 
that becomes yep. a re- like a real issue. So there's a there's a timing thing there as well. Anyway, um, yep. something else to point out: no impetuosity. Hey, oh, well, on, oh, well, on uh, the on the orc no. shaman. Oh, Chill lovely. AF, bro. Chill AF. Just back there, feeling the feeling the vibes of Gork and Mork, just coursing through his body. He don't care. He he's not in patch. He's got nowhere to. He's got nowhere to be. He's just casting magic on time. That's all he's doing. Goblin shaman. So yeah, goblin shaman uh, and night goblin shaman. So slightly different. Uh, you've got uh, sorry, night goblin shaman is here. Um, you've got night goblin shaman is illusion and war magic. Uh, goblin shaman is elementalism and war magic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're not that much cheaper. They're 135 points. 130 points between the two. So that versus an orc, but they're toughness four with three wounds, which is kind of really nice. Yep, I'm, I'm happy uh, with that. Pretty, pretty sweet. And then the the best thing about a goblin shaman uh, versus um, the night goblin is that he can go on a he can go on a wolf. Um, again, does not have impetuous. That gives him a nine inch move. It's not flying, but it's a lot cheaper than a magic carpet. Um, and um, and uh, so, like again, it gives you a really mobile caster and has access to elementalism and wall magic. Two fantastic lords. Um, so there's a really good argument that you don't need the 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 you know the um, orc shaman on the on the wyvern or whatever. You put this guy on a wolf. Put the put the night goblin on a on a magic carpet. You got two incredible mobile casters, slightly cheaper. They're wonderful. They're great, 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 great. Yeah, I think, the, or- I think the orc and goblin roster is really benefits from the fact that it has like a cheap unit line that like that you can lean into to spend points on when almost every other roster doesn't have that like your lords and heroes are normally almost always really really good versions of whatever the baseline is um but because these are like inherently weak i guess in quotation marks they they end up pretty cheap although you know 135 points for a level 3 cast isn't cheap 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 uh but you know, it, it's cheap enough you're still pay- yeah you're, you're you're paying the points for them but i mean also i think actually the inverse of that is really where the strength is it's that you can spend on very expensive characters or you can really front load on the characters because your you, your core is quite affordable and stock very good so because it you know they have very good stats and rules tons of rules um that means that you can still have a tremendous board presence and have all the toys like you can have boys and toys in this army huh eh? not bad <laughs> not um bad. so it's 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 a really really strong thing um and then of course the the, the most major thing to note about the night gabo again no impetuousness on the, on either on any of these guys um the night gabo um fear of elves hatred dwarves though so that's nice um <laughs> warband as well uh, which is really nice because their leadership is like yes yeah and the and the same thing that goes for um uh now does the orc shaman have warband yeah uh, the orc that. shaman yes yeah it does have warband he does okay so they all have warband that's great uh and the orc shaman uh, shaman also gets the benefit of the plus one a cast that's just something to remind i've not everyone, played with i know we've already told him but just to remind everyone warband is going to be for every rank that you have in your unit you're going to have plus one to your leadership that's what it's for. Therefore, is yeah. excellent for big blocks of stuff. And the base leadership on the shaman is at eight. Shaman is eight, and then the gobos is sixes. I think. Uh, sixes. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah. cool. So, That's... so yeah, the night goblin sh- the shamans can get up to leadership nine because often too they'll have horde in that unit, so they can get up to plus three. So that's pretty good on the on the leadership um, for these guys because leadership does come into play um, for a couple of different tests for these guys. Big deal with the Night Goblin Shaman is Illusion. Um, Illusion, obviously, again, has two of the most important uh, game shaping and control spells, I think, that exist in the game right now, and I've come a long way on this. Now I'm probably too hyperbolic because obviously they can be countered, um, but as of right now, they sure feel pretty useful and strong. Um, So having access to an Illusion Caster makes any armor way better, any army way better. I love putting this guy on a carpet so that he's always in the right position to be able to cast those things. Uh, Again, heavy investment, 40 points to give this person, give this character fly 10, um, but really important. Also love giving the Illusion Caster the uh, knobbly stick or whatever for the reroll to cast because, again, they're hard to get off and very Yeah, so you're looking at like 230 points for your level 4 on a carpet with a, with a thing. That's a lot, right? Like, you're spending points worth every Worth every penny. Yeah. Uh, worth every penny. Because, A, easy to protect, 
right? Because you can keep him out of danger because he can just fuck off. He can go really far. If we discover that fly stacks, which is totally a thing that might be real. Everyone's talking um, about that right now. Whole Town Stocking does fly stack because Illusion has their, their conveyance spell is to gives fly 10 to a, to a target character. So he can give himself, when he's on a magic carpet, an additional fly 10, which means he's just moving 20 and marching 40. <laughs> uh, this is a problem. Which is funny. Which is, which is a problem Problem if you're trying to catch the slippery git. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's already hard to catch him on when he's just on a regular carpet because he's got Swift Stride 2, so he's going to flee 3d6 if he wants to get the hell out of there. Um, something important about that uh, that I realized too is that when you flee with a magic with a caster, um, you don't rally until after your next uh, conjuration phase. So that's actually kind of an interesting thing. So although I was able to fl- get him out of danger against a really dangerous charge, I couldn't then cast any of his really important hexes and, and enchantments in the following uh, phase because he w- hadn't rallied yet. Mm. Kind of neat. Yeah, that um, is, that is neat. What you wonder could have used rallying cry. That's yeah, so a I was really good to, use of rallying cry. That is about to say rallying cry would supersede that, which I think is quite interesting. Um, that's cry- why we're deep diving, Rob. R- that's why we're deep diving here. <laughs> <laughs> Rally, rallying cry is better than like like I keep skipping it, not skipping it, but like when I do the overviews. But I'm like rallying cry is great. Like you need to really recognize that. But anyway, yeah. Um, Anywho, uh, because yeah, yeah because it happens before the conjuration phase, so I could have rallied him so that he could then cast. Whereas because I rallied him at the re- at the normal point, which is after he's able to cast, he was unable to cast. But rallying cry would have bailed me out there. That's cool. I'm going to tell the guy I played against. You got to be near, um, you got to be near your guy that does rallying cry though. So that's more of a problem, I think, than anything. So what's the uh, range of rallying cry? Rallying cry is be nine inches range. Uh, initially, and then your command range. I'm almost certain it's command range. Yeah. I wonder if it would be 18 inches on a large. Anyway, uh, that's that's a little too techy for this. But anyway, so essentially, magical power in orcs and goblins is gigantinormous. Wa magic's amazing. Illusion's amazing. Battle magic's amazing. Elementalism's amazing. If you had to pick four to have, you can't go wrong with those four. Well, I think um, I think this is kind of like a, a again, like we've said with the black orcs and everything else. Like this is where you're making decisions, and sometimes you're making decisions here, and then you're fitting everything in. And then sometimes mm-hmm. you're starting where we get to units. You're starting units, and then you're working your way up. So it really depends. Are you building blocks that you want to buff? Are you shutting down enemy wizards with with like like? Are you engaging in that? Like there's the, which is why interestingly the next thing I want to jump to is not to the units themselves because I think in this process I think this will always be true. The lords and heroes. You obviously you can build through that way. And then you can build through the wizards as well. And then that will really start to define, especially the access to the laws, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the thing I'd like to look at next, uh, I'll try and find them, go in the army construction, is the war machines. Now, it might sound like an odd choice before we look at the units. The reason I would like to talk about it is for some armies, it will be very definitive. And for some armies, mm-hmm. it might not be very definitive. But mm-hmm. what it does is it will always build into the tempo of your army. It's similar mm-hmm. to looking at the volume of cavalry you have and the volume of infantry that you have. Like, if you don't have any good cavalry, your army is slow. Look at dwarfs. But they have access to, obviously, the potential of doing long-range output all the time. Same with wood elves. Wood elves do have cavalry. They've also got... Like, I would just put <laughs> wood elves shooting in with artillery, right? It's what I'd basically yeah. do. And there mm-hmm. are no shooting units dedicated in this roster but the reason i'd like to look at these first which are night goblin bolt throwers you can take two per thousand points uh mm-hmm. then the rock lobber you can have one per thousand points and the doom diver uh you can have one per thousand points so those are your war machines yes right those are your war machines you seem mm-hmm. unimpressed by them in this roster but do you understand why i think it would be always the next thing i would do in a list <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, but that's go on. That is more of a that. So that is a me poo pooing war machines in general. Okay. So especially in, li- in so where war machines I think are more important are armies that don't have access to the four best spellcasting lores in the game. Each one, each one of which has an ama- amazing magic missile, which is going to be, in my opinion, better than any of these war machines in almost all situations. So. Yeah. So, but the so thing that's is you that's can where... add on to that, right? So you could have your level four caster with your magic missiles and all the stuff that you've got, 
and add on war machines to this this conversation. Like you don't, it's not a one or. But sure, everyone's fighting for points. If I was to buy, yeah, you only have two thousand points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm to buy two rock lobbers, actually, am I better just trying to get myself another level four? That's a great question. And in some armies, you just don't aren't able to have a cheap level four, as an example, right. uh, or an additional cheap level four. So maybe you are going to be going to an artillery piece. But what I mean by this is, is if you do have bolt throwers, rock lobbers, and doom divers you immediately are engaging with your opponent. You haven't got to go as fast. Your opponent has sure. to be like, okay, you're starting to pick up points at range. Are you killing units with these? No. Maybe, though. Like, early game, make unit panic off the board. There's an option. Look, look. I, I, I need to not... It's because, actually, I just did something that I think is one of the most insufferable things because, also, invariably, when I make a hard take like that, I am completely fucking wrong. So, <laughs> load up on your war machines, guys. Um, so the thing that here, here's, I think in general, I just, when I took out my doom divers, I freed up 200 points that I was much happier to spend elsewhere. That was my own personal experience. Doom divers are sick. A, because they're doom divers. There are literally goblins who've strapped in like, you know, you know, the, have you ever seen the like ancient footage of the guy who tried to invent a parachute and jumped off the Eiffel tower to oh, his yeah. death? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's doom divers. It's, it's the weaponized version of that dumb guy. Um, it is just categorically, it's just, all it is is a better uh, rock, uh, like stone thrower. So yeah. essentially, what it lets you do is remove, is is subtract D three from the scatter, um, uh, which so it's just for twenty points extra, you have a more accurate rock lobber, rock lava, rock um, lava. which which is good because rock lava's number like stone thrower's number one problem is inaccuracy, wild inaccuracy. Um, so a a Doom Diver is just a better stone thrower. If you like stone throwers, obviously that's going to be pretty good. Um, but they're 95 points, right? Um, so, you know, that comes at its at, at its own disadvantage. We've also covered in previous shows and here that, you know, a uh, stone thrower, that three-inch template, unfortunately, ain't what it used to be. Uh, you got bigger base sizes now, which means they're hitting fewer models. And then on top of that, anything they only partially hit are only hit on a four-up. So their ability to deal with large units is is reduced. You have to center it on the like. There's just a lot of downsides to stone throwers and template weapons in general. I feel like if you have options to do that kind of a reach out and touch somebody thing better, I think I think it behooves you to look at the better ways to do it. That being said, quantity is a quality all of its own. So two rock lobbers and two doom divers that could be kind of insufferable, especially if you're running something that's more of a come at me bro type list with, with orcs and goblins, which is totally an archetype you could lean into. I definitely think that there would be play there because now all of a sudden you've got more, more, more pulls on that slot machine to, you know, hit the target properly to, you know, punk the, 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 uh, the dragon level character because they're great at, at that kind of a thing, et cetera. Um, yeah, so there's definitely an opportunity, but I, I think there are better ways to do the similar thing. Yeah, I think I think this is always going to be a conversation people are going to have, and maybe they'll end up with a, a best case situation. But I, I, I honestly like so having played a couple of games, uh, the worst situation with my Warriors of Chaos at the moment, I haven't got myself a Hell Cannon uh, ATM, um, and I really don't want to get a Hell Cannon. It's two hundred plus points, like it's a lot. Like you know, y this is what I was trying to say about Orcs and Goblins as well. It's like you're cheap, seventy five points for a Rock Lover. Just like launch it, like it's cheap. Like you're talking like magic item level, especially when we start talking about bolt throwers. Literally pennies, sure. like absolute pennies. Points, yeah. Um, but like you know, I, that's all I've got. So otherwise, my warriors mm -hmm. army is just very slowly walking up the board. If I'm doing infantry, that's what it is. All my cavalry is expensive as hell. Uh, so you've got you once you're in a position where you feel weak, which is they have ranged output and you don't. The pressure really feels like it's on you, and there's the opportunity in the orc and goblin roster to at least create. Um, tempo for you. Your opponent is going to feel under yep. pressure, and that's important. Like that's important against the right lists. Some are, some units, um, armies, uh, army archetypes you could trade okay with, which I think is interesting and important as well. Uh, but yeah, and, and we and, and we could get into so right now. Basically, I'm writing a magical skew, right? And I'm and I'm really passionate about it. But I'm also playing into a meta that probably hasn't caught onto that yet, right? So like hasn't caught onto the fact that magic is like can be really really uh, uh oppressive so if the meta leans into anti-magic like we covered three amazing items in this army alone 
that would be great. You could run no casters and orcs and like you could run one level one caster with the mirror, and you could run the rest just magical defensive items, and you'd probably be okay. Like you'd have a chance of being okay, uh, at least protecting the things that matter the most to you, right? Um, so like if the meta leans into anti magic, then skewing magic is actually a bad use of points. And suddenly that second caster that I have, the guy on the wyvern, who is my basically my battery, my the the, the guy that I use for my long range attacks, well, suddenly replacing him with two with two doom divers, uh, actually I could replace him with probably all four. <laughs> I could replace him with two rock lobbies and two doom divers. Maybe that does become a better play later on because I'm because suddenly my original idea of you know magical shooting just ain't good because everything's got magic resistance and there's a lot of counterplay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could definitely see a world where you're absolutely correct. As of right now, though, I'm horny for magic. Yeah, I just think and it's a I choice. Horny I don't think there's. I don't think yeah. there's a. I don't think there's a. There's a. The pro or con. I just think it's worth pointing out in kind of like an uh, an overview or a deep dive of this army is it's got the potential to sit back and be not passive but like be pressuring. You're pressuring your yes. opponent, and they have to engage with you. And then, because if someone else turns up with zero artillery, you now are creating a situation where they're running at you, which you love as we get into some of the units you've got in your army, which is good. So we like that. So, so for all four war machines, it's 340. That's literally, the literally, I could take my wyvern, my, my orc shaman on the wyvern out, and I could... The last kind of cheap bit I want to talk about uh, is that we have bolt throwers in this as well. So bolt throwers are knocking around. They're cheap. They're cheap. And like, you know, for the point of a magic item that we were looking at earlier, you could just have a couple of bolt throwers just just, just shooting stuff, just yamming away, just having an mm-hmm. okay time. Do they ever do anything? Do they ever make their 45 points back? I'm not sure, but they put pressure on people that they're going to maybe do that. And I mean, like, I mean, like, I think against heavy calf. I mean, how many how many guys do you have to skewer to to make your forty five points back? Right, like, not a ton. Um, you know, it it's also you know it's it's again it's a handy chip damage item. Um, for for me, uh, I, I found this actually even in eighth edition because the same thing was true in eighth edition where uh, eighth edition fantasy where they were very cheap and they seemed like an obvious choice. I have six of these guys like sitting in a box, um, like because I was like, oh, I break six of them. But then when you actually get it on the table, you know, getting them into a place where they can actually see anything, where they can actually be part of the fight was a bit tricky. Um, you know, being ballistic skill three means that they're, you know, a four when they're inside of half range uh, to hit with nothing obscuring. So again, there, there are there are just, you know, things that you have to manage on the table. But again, for 45 points, why not? I mean, it, it is pretty good. It would be something that I think you would want to lean into, though. Um, whereas like, if it's like, I've got 45 points left, I'll just throw in a uh, bolt throw up. Maybe not the best use of points, but okay, I'm going to take three of these. How do I optimize my army around that? Like going to the gun line action, uh, sort of option. I think there's play there and that would be how you would want to think about it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's all. I, I just want people to be conscious of the fact that you're going to have builds and play styles which are going to be very long range and they're going to say you come to me and it's yep. not like they are like gun lines are always hilarious people are like yeah i'll just run at the gun line and beat it up do you think that they're not like do, they, do you think they don't know you're going to do that like their right. plan is to shoot you until you arrive and then yes. counter charge you so and i think orcs and goblins maybe more than anyone else have got like that layered counter charge response uh, mm-hmm. when we get to fanatics and stuff. All right, okay. Yep. So War Machines. So let's start looking at core. We've got Orc Mobs, Goblin Mobs, Snotlin Mobs, Goblin Spider Rider Mobs, Goblin Wolf Rider Mobs, Goblin Mobs mm-hmm. per... Uh, there's a bunch of stuff to say, here, like Night Goblin Squig Herds, a bunch of stuff. But I think, can we just jump to the star of the show? Because I think there is a star of the show. Night Goblins? It's Night Goblins, baby. It, oh, yeah. it, has, it has to be night goblins, right? Like, if you're looking, if you're talking about this army, that's funny. Are they impetuous? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know why, but they're not. Apparently, living in the dark makes you uh, less less uh, anxious to get into combat. Well, if I'm in a dark uh, yeah. cave, I don't want to run around, get stuck like that guy in the cave. I don't want that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you want to stay. You want to conserve your energy. Don't move around too fast. Uh, and hang out with lunatics who swing around with giant wrecking balls. Yeah, Night Goblin fanatics are fabulous. These would be like my two block infantry units that I, I like to use. Um, and they can also be kitted out. I think actually when we looked at the winning list from 
uh, the Old World's first GT up in Sweden uh, last week, I kind of like went, hmm, that's interesting. That's pretty cool because they kitted out, he kitted out his core block, like where my Black Orcs essentially would be in my battle line. He had a big unit of night, night goblins and it was fully kitted out. It had the netters, which on a two up gives your opponent minus one strength. Um, he importantly, had, uh, importantly, it's minus one strength, not if they swing at this unit. So if like if I oh, have it's just one, minus one strength, yeah, it's just minus one strength. That's kind of, I actually think that's a like a really key point. You're engaging multiple combats, even if you were to go for a small unit, night goblin mob with uh, netters. With some netters. Their, their job is to like really swing because you know when you, we've got orcs and other stuff, so they're a support mm -hmm. unit as well as their own unit potentially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that's that's super uh, super good point that like. So, for example, a minimum unit of night goblins could have so uh, you know only ten bodies in it. Could in the in those ten bodies have three fanatics? A fanatic, for those of you who don't know, should I just quickly delve into fanatics? Yeah, let's let's do this. Oh, just by the way, this is a unit of ten, and they're three points a model: strength, toughness, three. Points. Like they're incredibly low elite leadership, so that's kind of mm -hmm. like a, a key point I think to bring up. And we could talk about the loadouts for them as well. But yeah, I think the star of the show is the fanatic. So let's let's discuss it. So fanatics essentially, you can have up to three of them in in a unit. They are expensive; they're twenty five points per model. Um, but compared to what they used to be, they're like way meaner than they used to be. Um, so let's look at what they are now. So at the start of any turn, uh, basically in the start of uh, uh, start of turn phase, you can release uh, you know one to three of these fanatics within the unit. Uh, they have to be within three inches of the concealing unit, which means they're really starting about four inches away because really only the back edge of that base needs to tag uh, the unit. They're on a 25 millimeter round. Um, so they're already starting four inches out ish, like from the front of their base. And then uh, once you get into your uh, compulsory moves phase, they move 2d6 in a direction of your choosing. Um, and at that point, you know, like that's an average of seven, but that means that when you're within 11 inches, uh, there's a good chance that you can touch something that's nearby. Um, and, um, because you can do it in either your own turn or your opponent's turn, if someone is getting close to you to charge you, say a big unit of heavy cavalry, which will be very vulnerable to D6, strength 5, negative 3 AP hits, which is what happens when you contact a fanatic, um, you could just speed bump a unit that really doesn't want to have anything to do with them <laughs> uh, before they charge. Um, so like, even if they don't make it to the unit that you're targeting, as long as they're in front of it and they have to be charged through, that's a problem for them. Big problem. Um, the other thing about fanatics now is that they are much harder to remove from the table. They really only die when you roll a double for their movement, which can happen on when they come out. It's happened to me where, you know, when I release the fanatics, the first move I go to make is a double and they just immediately die. Um, or any time that they move, because in subsequent compulsory move phases, both sides, um, they move in a random direction 2d6. So you don't control them after they're released, so they can cause an issue for you too. Um, but they become this swirling melee of big danger that is hard to remove the table because the only other ways to get rid of them are if they hit each other. Because uh, if they come in contact with a model, they deal d6, strength 5, negative 3 hits. Uh, and coming in contact with another fanatic would trigger that, so they would actually hurt each other, and generally speaking, they would die unless you roll a lot of ones in a row. <clears throat> and then the other way that they die is if they contact any sort of terrain. Outside of that, uh, there's also if a template scatters onto them, they can't be targeted, but if like a, uh, you know, if a stone thrower to fall on them, they have a, they can be hit by that, uh, but they can't be, you can't target it with a stone thrower uh, because they cannot, cannot be the target of shooting attacks, they cannot be the target of charges. Um, another crazy thing about these guys is because they're just released at the start of turn phase, um, uh, they can be released when you're in combat. They can be released into a combat. Um, so that makes them incredibly destructive. So if you're, if you have a unit, that's maybe the unit that holds them or has them, that is just hold like holding up a unit that they're in combat with. They can release three fanatics to the side and just run them right through that unit and deal a tremendous amount of damage to them while they're in combat. It doesn't count towards res, but it's going to hurt them really badly. Um, fanatics are just, a really strong model. Um, there's arguments to be made to just lean into this as much as you possibly can um, and just have just as many fanatics as you possibly can um, because it's just going to potentially just wipe your, your, your opponent off the, off the, the tabletop. Uh, yeah. You combine 
You combine itchy nuisance with fanatics, like say against, you know, your big lord level dragons. So like a toughness six dragon, you know, you get a good itchy nuisance roll as minus three toughness. Um, suddenly, you know, you're wounding it on twos uh, with a strength five fanatic at minus three. Um, you know, you can kill big stuff with them. Uh, when you combine them with other things in the army, so fanatics, 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 fanatics. Yeah, I think I think the the key element is the when you release. Like what they do is great, but will you release them at the start of the turn, and your opponents start the turn as well. And I think this is just this is a problem unit that you as the orc like you can have a big melee unit of black orcs, but in a mirror, then two units of of night garbo blocks are just going to launch six fanatics into that and yes the black orcs will eventually beat up the two night garbo blocks but they will take so much damage and will be that much more expensive than those two night goblin blocks with fanatics so they're just even inside of its own book there isn't a conversation where anything else beats out this unit for its points cast and what it can opportunity do, in my personal opinion, like it's just it's just a superstar unit from this. In maybe a problematic way, it might be too good when you can release them. The fact that they're untargetable is bananas. Uh, but if you're playing orcs and goblins, I don't know why you're not playing night goblins and fanatics. Because also, even if you don't lean into it, we haven't really talked about night goblins as a unit yet, but we should. Even if you don't lean into it. Like this sheer cheap, they're so cheap just to do that job uh, as like what you would consider to be like a screening. Yeah, to, to unlock to unlock three fanatics, essentially, you got to pay a tax of thirty points. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So like, so it's one hundred and five. If you just wanted a fanatic delivery system, uh, you're at one hundred and one hundred and five points, and you only need one of those goblins to survive long enough to release the fanatics. Right. So like. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there's there's certainly a world where you could just lean right into this. It is mitig It is sort of constrained a little bit by the fact that you need for each night goblin unit you bring, you need to have a night goblin character. So that's either a boss or a war boss or one of the shaman characters. So they are they are one much like the black orcs. They're one to one. They're locked to that. But for each night goblin character you bring, it actually unlocks three units and unlock squig hoppers, uh, squig herds and night goblins, all three of which are fantastic units. So it's hardly attacks. And as we've already covered, the night goblin characters are really good. Um, and, uh, and excellent for their points. So there's really no downside to leaning into night goblins and going night goblin heavy. I do think that they're so good that it kind of overshadows some of the other fun stuff too, that's available. But for me, these guys sit on the, uh, like basically they sit on the flanks of my, of my black orcs. Black orcs are in the core. These guys are on on either side of them, and you know, like so that means that any sort of uh, you know flanking heavy cavalry or anything big coming at the black orcs, um, or for that matter, as I advance out onto the table, I'm able to just target things and often hurt them really badly with these. And then don't discount the fact that they probably continue to be tremendous assholes and spin around <laughs> and kill stuff as the game goes on. Um, because so units like you aren't this... fast. Units aren't fast. Like if if you can release this into the middle, like you know, there's ways. We were talking about the fact that there's ways to you know make you, the night goblin mobs move even faster up the board to release you know into the army when it's like clumped up. Uh, mm -hmm. I think is uh, I think is an interesting uh, choice. And then they're just spinning amongst all those different units potentially and causing some real issues. Uh, what one thing to point out about them, especially if you've used to, if you're used to using fanatics, is that they no longer um, they're like vortices in the sense that they when they pop out, basically they'll contact the unit and then they have to continue through the unit and they come out the other side. It used to be that they would continue along and use up any any movement that they hadn't had like used yet. Um, but that's no longer the case. They actually stop as soon as they're just a little bit past the unit. So like they hit one. So in order to hit multiple units in one turn, it's still possible, but they have to hit it something that's maybe next to a unit that's less than a base size away. So like you would need to drop it into it. Like to really get that cascading effect, um, is a little bit harder than it used to be at least, but still very possible in certain situations. And they move in both players turns, which is, Yes. Uh, horrific. So yeah, so that means that each each yeah, that's right. That means in both both sides of the turn, you have the opportunity to deal D6 strength five, negative three AP hits. 
Yeah, very good. It's crazy. It's crazy. Very, very, very good. It's very good. Uh, let's just talk about Night Goblin bombs themselves, right? Because you can obviously use them, uh, and you will use them as Night Goblin fanatic delivery systems. But are you going to go cheap with doing that? Or are you going to build them up? And this is kind of true for the goblin units in themselves. They got low leadership, mm -hmm. the strength and toughness. I mean, strength three is pretty good. Strength and toughness three, but their weapon skill. This is the kind of interesting element. Their weapon skill is really low. It's weapon skill two, but their ballistic mm -hmm. skill is three, which is why my brain said change from their hand weapons and shields and give them short bows. I quite like that idea because yeah. they're, they're not awful at shooting, right? Um, and then as soon as you do that, you go, okay, actually, short bows, they've got volley fire. That's a lot of shots, potentially, and it's very cheap. You end up at four points a model, and you uh, they have horde and they have warband. So they start a leadership four, uh, sorry, leadership five if they've got the boss. But if you mm -hmm. have uh, a character in there, and like you said, you need one for these units, then there'll be leadership six, and then they can go up to leadership nine for that yeah. unit so that unit could stick around even if it was um even if you know you, they ended up killing the character you would still be leadership uh eight for the unit eight yep yeah Which and that's a... where my guys usually yeah my guys usually sit at leadership eight unless they're within the range of the of the general um but yeah like i i think that's good i i think there's a certainly an argument for the short bow short, bow, short bows and even the thrusting spears again if you're just going night goblin as your theme as your army by the way, you can almost just pick one of every unit, and that's a good army, like straight up. Like they're very good. Um, but um, you know, yes, it's cheap to take thrusting spears or the short bows, but it's also thirty three percent more, right? Like it's a third more expensive for them because they're going from three to four. That's actually that is a large expense, especially if it's a bigger brick. Um, it's not free to to add that amount. Like, are you going to make the thirty points back with having short bows on them? Maybe. Um, but it's, you know, 18 inch range, all that kind of stuff. I'm not fully sold. Um, but I don't think it's a bad idea by any stretch of the imagination, especially if you have the models. I also just don't have short bow models. Um, so, um, I think, I think totally a thing you could, you could do. I, I really like that from the, uh, from the version of this, of, of the night goblin list we looked at last week. Um, yeah, also, also, if we just shout out the fact that they can take a 50 point magic standard is nuts. Yeah, and as pointed out, every single standard uh, available is uh, is is fifty points or less for 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 orcs and goblins. Something to point out about the weapon skill too is that means that if you're up against a weapon skill five uh, unit, which is basically any elite infantry, would be weapon skill five, um, you are getting hit on twos. Yeah, so that is like a big threat to their general survivability. So something like the big red raggedy flag, which gives them the plus one weapon skill and plus one combat res on a big brick like up 40, like we saw, um, you know, taken as their unit standard suddenly makes them a lot more defensible because they're not, you know, they're, they're really reducing the amount of uh, two plus uh, hits that they're, they're suffering. So this is where, like, one of the things that's interesting to me at the moment in the meta, like, uh, obviously, like, we're still really early. So if you're watching this, give me your best horde clearing unit. That's what I want. I want the, I've got a million dudes what are you doing to get rid of a million dudes out of an army? Because these are cheap as hell. Like, And the problem with this is I've got a unit of Chaos Knights. Let's say Chosen Chaos Knights. I don't have a lot of them. I maybe you've got like six to ten. Mo maybe. And that's the biggest unit in my army. That's like, I wouldn't take it, obviously. That's not really a good choice. But still, I line up against this unit, which is huge. This It's like 50 models, right? It costs nothing. Right, they're going to launch three fanatics at me. Let's just say two hit me. I'm going to lose a couple of knights on the way in, which is going to be you could a lose them all. You could le legitimately, you could lose all of them. Yeah, I, I guess could, I could lose a lot. Is the point right? But I lose a couple, and then I get into combat. I don't think that that blocks ever killing them all. Like maybe, maybe it's going to take two, three, four turns uh, to get through them. Right. So this is just the th conversation that the meta isn't having yet. I think that's a production meta issue. And generally, hordes are a bit of a nightmare anyway to to build, paint, put on the tabletop. But I, when you and me talked about this unit, I was like, dude, you could take fucking a million of these guys, right? And I don't know why you wouldn't. In that particular matchup question, if they get there, they do have first charge. So in that first round of combat, there's a not... It's not uh, impossible to imagine a scenario where they win the combat, 
Yeah. And suddenly they don't have any uh they they don't have any bonuses to their leadership. Now their leadership five, let's assume that they're not getting inspiring presence. Now their leadership five. That is that is obviously a leadership check that you could just fail easily on two D six and suddenly now you're getting chased now you're chasing down that unit. Um, so like that is a, that is a totally plausible scenario. Um, and I think that is essentially how you deal with the large bricks. Um, it's just, well, it's, not, no, no, it's, to, it's how you deal with the large bricks in that very specific scenario where you decided not to be near inspiring presence and, and they were able to get first charge off and you didn't do anything to mitigate first charge. Like, like that's kind of my point. Like you don't have to just send them out there like completely free wild. I'm not saying a block on its own, but you're right. There are, my, there will my, be my ways point to is, deal with is, it. Is, my my point is is not necessarily just that very specific scenario. The, the is like dealing with big blocks. If I'm answering your question, I think it's probably like you're trying to break them. You're gonna find a ways. Yeah, to, yeah, I to agree. Terra, a good example of something yeah. to yeah, a hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah, I think. But like, I see this and I'm like, I you do a ton of damage, which I hate. Hard. And then how do I get rid of it? I don't know. And yeah. I look at different lists and I'm like, what am I using to blend? And the problem is, fifty night gobos is right now not the conversation. The conversation is something on a dragon. So mm-hmm. everyone is tooled up to smack a dragon, and you're like, you smack a goblin all day. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Right. Uh, so, um, which I think is interesting. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to see, because you know, there's definitely lots of people out there who have the models to do this. And I have the models to do this. Like, I, I've, I've got an 8th edition Orcs and Goblin army that, has a ton of night goblin models like I, I could lean into that old style of like very large units it's interesting that i haven't um because i and again looking at like even like i because my units are 30 like going to that 40 taking the thrusting spears being being wide enough that you know they could be hitting back with 20 attacks um you know in the right situation um yeah, that's pretty cool. And there's all kinds of, again, in WA magic and in the signatures, yes. there's all kinds of things that are going to help you buff these guys and make them good. So you kind of get into that super, like, like you, you can give them the good mushrooms and these guys are, are, are going to be zoomed up. You know, their opponents less one strength to less. Um, there's all Three kinds of things this. you can do. You know, like 100%, Rob. Like, there's there's definitely lots you can do to make these guys really good in a lot of, in like super fun ways too. And then at their base, at their base, or three points a model, you can take three fanatics. They're still going to get in the way, even if you don't buff them up. They're going to be annoying to chew through or try and break or whatever. Um, they're still holding those hundred and whatever points. Um, you know, it's it's just a great it's a great unit, man. Great unit. I love, well, we I can, love the we, night Yeah, we can we can move on, but like I think we've I think this is it feels like the superstar unit at the moment um, because of the fanatics and the fanatics and the netters. And the netters, the, like, they just have a lot of value built into them. The other units would kill for like, the op, the op, yeah, and the options on them. Like, I mean, again, the thrusting spears are a great option. The the sharp bows are a great option. The 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 magic banner is a great option. Like, it's it's all good here. Like, it's it's just a beautiful, wonderful unit, and one of the most iconic, obviously, in Warhammer Fantasy. So it's great to see them being so good. One thing though, like like the black orcs though, is they do tremendously overshadow other options that you have in the list, um, such as you know regular goblins. Um, well, that's, or, that's yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I wanted to talk about because obviously you have regular goblins, but just in every way it feels like because it's effectively the same loadout: hand weapons and shields, same stat line apart from one higher leadership, which I think is important. Mm-hmm. Short bows, thrusting spears. Uh, you can have skirmishes, which is actually a really nice thing if you want to put a wizard inside of it. I like that. Um, I uh, haven't noticed that actually. Yeah, you can, can this one be sh- goblin mobs? Yeah, can, can. Be skirmishes. Yeah. One unit per thousand. Okay. 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 Yeah. So that's a bad. really good use for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they've got warband, but they don't have horde, so you're only going to be adding plus two onto their they, leadership. No, they do have. They do have horde. They do have horde. Oh yeah, I just didn't read it right. Yep. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, all good. Okay. All so good. then, oh, I mean, these guys can go up to leadership nine, then, so they can stick around a little bit more, um, which is better. Uh, but yeah, you're basically building the. Oh, and they could take light armor, so they can be an actual aggressive <laughs> defensive unit because they've got a five up save light armor shield. But the mm-hmm. thing is, they've got nasty skulkers, which are this kind of like uh, unit that pops out of them and does some damage. But they're yeah, not yeah, anyway. It's their, but, it's their fanatic equivalent, yeah. But they're just not as good in remotely. Not nearly, yeah. And yeah. therefore, it's not that we're skipping that, the goblin mobs and nasty skulkers. It's just a bested slot and. Nasty Skulkers aren't it. Sorry, guys. 
I think yeah. that's a fa- I think that's a fair point, right? I think it is. I think um, the one to look at too here is like orc mobs, like uh, regu- yeah, regular old orc, orc, orc boys. We're going to um, like th- this is just an epic unit. Uh, like card, like as far as like <laughs> it's huge, the, it's ludicrous. Uh, so they made they basically made every version of an orc boy one one unit that includes error boys, orc boys, orc biggins, uh, savage orcs, and savage orc biggins. So that's five units uh, on this one unit on this one unit card. Um, so obviously there's play here. Um, I think there's there's lots of you know options that that can be used to make good units again combined with you know, things that you can do to mitigate things like impetuosity, i.e. having a brick of black orcs or black orc characters. Um, I think for six points per, what do we think? Um, uh, Sorry, five points per as base. I think they're cheap. I think they're cheap. They're mm-hmm. toughness four, so uh, that's nice. Uh, you know, <laughs> you can do a lot to this unit as well, big ones as well. I think one of the things that, because it's kind of interesting, this unit and goblins are economies of scale units, kind of what I think of them. It's like the whole Empire roster. You're like, you can make every every unit in the Empire roster is pretty shit, but you can kind of make them better. I really, really de- hating on the Empire roster at the minute. I don't know why, but I apologize. Not, demi- <laughs> not yep. demigriffs, obviously. Um, yeah. But like, it's kind of shit, but you can buff it up and make it better. And I'm like, cool. But what if the buffs don't go off? And they're like, well, that sucks. Uh, so like, and it's kind of that magical dominance thing that you were talking about. What you're doing right now is you're using magic to really control the enemy units. Um, and then in some cases debuff them. Whereas, uh, with orc mobs, you definitely could do a lot of buffs to really make these guys sing and shine. Uh, and mm-hmm. they're cheap. So you can have a lot of them as well, but a lot of stuff doing nothing. I don't really see what the purpose of it is because I think you're doing, what am I, you, you have combat units and their job is is to kill stuff or win through combat res. And then mm-hmm. you have tanking units. And obviously you can have a combination of the both. But their job is to stop an enemy unit from just running into your lines and you're controlling them so that you can counter charge into them. That's how I see them. Like I see yep. 50 night gobos with the, you know all of the characters nearby to make sure they're as safe as possible. Just standing there, just taking a beating from something as you charge in manglers or something else into the sides that's their job Mm -hmm. and orc mobs can do the same but they're just not as good as the night gobbo's doing it so why would i have them am i making sense that's kind of no you are you are like uh, i you know they're they're not quite twice as expensive as well but they do have you know additional toughness additional weapon skill over the night goblin um and then the uh you get a lot of attacks out there you get a lot. Of, you, well, you can uh, if you frenzy them. Frenzy um, additional so like, hand weapons, yeah. Yeah, additional hand weapons. True. So you, yeah, you can get up to three attacks per. So like, as far as something that's going to go out there and and chop stuff up, uh, that could be really good. That's three attacks per model. Like you could have a big wide unit of savage orcs um, cruising across the battle uh, the the field uh, as a missile. You can give them the plus one strength banner. Get them up to strength five uh, with armor bane. Like it's it's. Like there, there are definitely like things that you can do with this unit card. There's just too many options, especially too like you can have them with um, you can Biggins. make skirmishers. Um, like the skirmishers thing is great for you know making um, a bunch of error boys uh, skirmishers with an orc shaman that we talked about before to give them that um, a nice bunker and a plus one to cast. Um, you know, so like these guys, and also you combine them like regular boys that are biggins with. Um, uh, with uh, you know a mob of black orcs next door to them, suddenly they're not impetuous. They're a lot more controlled. Um, you know, like there's, I think there's definitely play here if you really like boys. I don't think there's anything necessarily like awful, like game losing about them. Unlike say regular goblins, I still don't think there's a place for regular goblins. Um, but uh, these guys, I, I mean, they're, they're toughness four. You know, decent stat line models. Like they're not, they're not. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think, like with, I guess, I guess to be fair to them, like with any of the other units in the the army, you're like, you're really, if you're gonna do all mobs in any particular amount, then you are building into that. You're like, I have a plan mm-hmm. for my orc mobs, which I don't mm-hmm. know why then that plan isn't just for your black orc mob instead. Like if you're gonna buff a unit to the heavens, that's probably the unit to buff versus mm-hmm. an orc mob because then you can only buff so many units in so many ways so that's kind of where i am with that you know but it, there's no reason you can't 
uh, do the same thing with the orc mobs, I guess. And again, you've got a lot of wounds potentially because they're so cheap, depending on the way you want to build them. Uh, so yeah, I think I, I can take a magic standard uh, as well, but I think that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm not putting. I don't feel I'm putting characters inside units, so I'm not doing that. And with the oh, this is the other thing as well. I wanted to say sorry, is that they're infantry. So mm -hmm. now I have to spend points to magically buff them, items and other stuff, and then mm -hmm. I need other smaller units to screen against the enemy fast units to mm -hmm. slow them down so that I can get the charge off because they're initiative three. So if I'm playing elves, yeah. they're all I eat, like even if I charge, it's iffy if I'm getting to swing. Even if. So now I need to make it so, because that's a, the, probably the overarching conversation we have sometimes as well. Movement plus initiative. Like if you already start with good movement, that's great because you're basically plus three initiative in combat. If you aren't, and you're basically the opponent's plus three initiative on top of high initiative. So elves are dumb yep. fast. They're quick, yep. and they also swing first. So that's a major downside to me personally that I really struggle with. So then they should just be tanking. And guess what? If you're going to screen with anything, it's going to be some night goblins with some fanatics. <laughs> right? Yeah. Why wouldn't it be? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I bumped in my green screen. Um, no, I, I, I don't think you're wrong. I just, I, again, I, I mean, I haven't put orc boys in my, in my, in my army. I just think that there's so much, there's just too much on this data slate or sorry, on this unit card that like, that there's gotta be some stuff that they can do. And I, and I do think the savage orcs, um, you know, just feel like there's gotta be something you can do with them, especially if you are getting the benefit of buffs, you know, like itchy, again, itchy nuisance to debuff initiative and toughness. Um, you know, and uh, there's also another one in Wa Magic itself. <clears throat> I think Orc Boys pair with or with Wa Magic specifically very well. Um, there's also built-in buffs we can do with banners. So I mean, again, I don't think there are. Are they the best in slot? Absolutely not. I do not think so at all. They're out outshined by fanatic by uh, both Night Goblins and Black Orcs. Um, but are they? If you, if this is what your Orc Goblin is made, Orc Army is made up of, you can definitely, I think, tool to play games with these guys and have a chance to win for sure. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you know what you're planning on doing with the unit. That's the important part. Yeah. Like you say, yes. what's like, the role? Yeah. Like you say, with so many options, you've got to choose what the role is going to be and how they're mm -hmm. winning or controlling the board. So you can win one of the two, yep. maybe two ways. So uh, just to jump through what the rest of the core units are. I would love to just like quickly pop by snotling, snotling mobs. No problem. No problem. Always a, a problem to find. But yeah, talk to me about snotling mobs. They, um, I just want to look at all of their, their USRs because they, they, I feel like they're a very good potential um, um, redirector or like uh, just model unit that you can use for um, just being annoying in the midfield and, and causing anything that is coming at you, like those big um you know heavy cab or whatever to use up their first charge like you were talking about um you know there there's there's some good option there they're 35 points each and they 30, need to be a minimum of, of two, two. 240 so 70 mil point unit yeah 240 mil bases gets you 12 wounds for 70 points not bad um still not as cheap as a goblin um but uh and 10 attacks if if they do wind up hitting things but they're immune to psych um they're impetuous um but they have open order uh, or skirmishers. You probably want open order here because it gives you the free pivot at the end of the, the, the move. But very importantly, unbreakable and vanguard. Vanguard lets them scout, move out into that into that neutral zone to be set up. Um, again, the only issue I have here is they're moving fives for some reason. So they have an eleven inch charge range. They are impetuous, so they could pull themselves out of where they want to be as far as like That's being a issue. redirector is concerned. That's the issue. Um, but I don't think that necessarily completely sinks them. I think they they could be very very good, um, and and a, and a useful, very useful techie unit, because um, they have so many imagine, other things going on. I mean, seventy points <laughs> with thirty five points off our night gobos with fanatics, like that's just the like the. It's really unfortunate how good, like because it just because in another army. This swarm unit that's unbreakable, immune to psychology. Um, but then in another army, you wouldn't have the black orcs that make it so that they wouldn't be impetuous. Because these are kind of perfect, <clears> right? <throat> they vanguard up the board, turn one, 
immediately yep. you've created a gap between your important units and your opponent. This is what I use yep. uh, my Chaos Warhounds for. Same thing. Then I use mm -hmm. them to move block, but I can't make them move block because they're gonna just charge off like little dickheads. So, <laughs> like, like oh, that, I think that's eleven inches away. So that that first vanguard move, don't you know? You're gonna want to be mindful of of how far you are away, right? Like you don't yeah. you don't want to be like danger close. And like, the, so they'll get a turn of, and, and they can march ten. So like, they can definitely by by the second turn, they can definitely be where you want them to be without risk of them, you know, fucking off and going to do, doing something stupid, and getting themselves killed. Um, so, you know, um, I don't know, I think, I think, especially, so put your hat on, put, put the hat on of a lot of people out there who don't have, or Sorry, don't Moth. want, maybe they just don't like, they just don't like Night Goblins, right? Mm -hmm. They don't like, um, um, you know, those particular units. I think Snotling Mobs could easily be just completely passed by. I think, you know, uh, in, in, it's, it's not, again, not best in slot as sort of a chaff unit for a lot of the reasons you described. Um, you know, a hundred, but they, but they do say? have a use. And, they do yeah, have a use in yeah. that role. Definitely. You're right. Yes. Yeah. They could be used in that. Yeah. You could have, I mean, which is fine as well. Um, it's all the, it's all the same role, right? You are doing, you're making your opponent have to, like we said with the coast chaos Knights, first charge. Now they're just charging into snotlin mobs. Boo mm -hmm. for you. You lose that mm -hmm. massive buff that you've got on a first charge, which is great. You yep. love that. That's yep. good. Yeah, yeah. Snotling so if you are bring, if you are horny for orc boys, maybe bring them some snotlings uh, to to soak up those first charges. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, because you need something that's going to be chaff and redirectors in a list. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't, I mean, I don't know what you're doing if you don't have that. I guess are you playing ogres? Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> no, no. Ogres have saber tusks, man. They're dope. Yeah, they're good. Um, so what we've got, uh, we've got, the, we've got Goblin Spider Rider mobs and golf, Goblin Wolf Rider mobs is what we've got. So we've got the two, <laughs> two kind of, kind of light cavalry in the list as well. Two light cav. I think these. Uh, I don't know. I like. Okay, now you can start your impetuous counter because these guys <laughs> are swift stride cavalry with impetuous, and they do not want to be in combat. These guys want to be the only combats they want to be in are ones that they are getting in the way of, right? Yeah. Um, I yeah. like so. Yeah, I agree with you. Like these, these are these are like big misses to me in some ways because they're very fast. Like you say, uh, they're impetuous, so they're going to be charging off and doing some fighting. So uh, yeah, uh, both of them. The one thing I'll say about Goblin Spider Riders is that they have poison, but the game should mm -hmm. be the game should be my opponent has some sort of screening stuff in front of their valuable stuff. I have some sort of screening stuff in front of my valuable stuff. That's how we start. Mm -hmm. And then we shoot off each other's stuff. We charge each other's stuff with our other chaff stuff. And then we eventually try and orchestrate our big stuff into your opponent's big stuff and, and win via that process. These guys are just going to yeet themselves. Like, they're weapon skill two for the goblins. And the spiders have got like an attack that's poisoned. And I'm like, this is just, they're just not going to, I just don't see what they do. Yeah. Short bows is interesting. Yeah, because they're I'd love these. I'd, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd love it if you could have like a big skirmishing unit of these guys with poison that they could just you know punk things with. Um, you know, uh, maybe ten of them with short bow, bows skirmishing around doing stuff. Impetuous really puts a a, a a kink in those plans. That being said, I mean, like if if you do have the black orcs and you don't go with the black orc lord, you could bring a black orc boss just on a on a on a on a on a hog. Have them running around out there, just keeping these types of units, including the Wolf Riders, in or in like in order, so that they're not running off and killing themselves. And suddenly, maybe you have a unit you can work with, so you could make it work. Um, but uh, you know, in general, it's going to be kind of annoying. It's something you have to mitigate um, because they have um, because they have the impetuous special. Well, it's just a lot. It's also, it's also it's also a big base like part of the board, right? If I have like even just five, and I've got short bows, I'm doing five shots. <laughs> which are hitting on force, <laughs> which are poison, sure. which I love. But now I've brought a special character just to babysit them to make sure they're mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, maybe, maybe there's something else he can babysit, right? Maybe he's also keeping the the boar boys behind, you know, in, in, in line, in, in, in order, in line, right? Like, you know, maybe he's doing more more work than just this unit. Um, but um, you know, it's something that you just need to factor for. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I do. I, I love poison. I think poison's a really good answer to. 
a lot of these big toughness things that we see rocking around. Sure, they've also got good armor saves or ward saves and everything else. But you just, you, you know, you put a lot of threat out there. How much are they? 12 points each. So my unit's going to cost 60 points before I do anything else. Okay, short bows is going to be 65 points. 65. 65, that's okay. I guess if you think about them, like the War Machine, like as a comparison, like is the War Machine going to do the same thing as the Spider Riders? Are they going to do different things? Uh, what's their job? They're definitely, would you describe, do you think that they're a fighting unit? These guys? No. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, unless, like maybe if they do get far enough downfield to get into the, you know, War Machines and stuff, like maybe you can go try and fight War Machines. This is probably a, I think Goblins on Spiders is really cool unit. How do I get this unit on the table type of unit? Okay. Um, and then you got to solve from there. Um, uh, but yeah, the, um, the, yeah, 360. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things I really like is move through cover. I think that's, that's quite rare. That's quite, that's quite beneficial. Like in the right situation, yeah. um, when they move through cover, they'll die <laughs> at the <laughs> other end. <laughs> it's less like yeah. they pop through a forest and they're like, surprise. And then the guys on the other end are like, yeah, surprise, you're dead. Yeah, yes, is- yeah, now you now you die. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, as a harassing, annoying, cool ass unit, nothing against spider rider mobs. The wolf riders um, are similarly. So they're so fast. So again, this is something that could maybe threaten the backfield. Pardon me a little bit for you. Um, uh, you know, you could skirmish them and then have the, uh, you know, have a, a wolf, uh, a, a wizard on a wolf in this unit. Um, I really love them. We were trying to figure out for a while to figure out how to get reserve, a reserve move on, on a, on a wizard. Unfortunately, I don't Can't think do the rules it. work that way. Yeah. Uh, they're the only, only orc and goblin unit with reserve. So reserve move means that in the shooting phase, you can make another move. Um, uh, you know, either if you shoot or not, so they can they can really haul ass. Um, and and also Actually, be I think in there's weird a place places. for this, right? Like, so movement nine, so like, so that's eighteen inches with a reserve move, like up the board, like that's going pat. Like, you know, if turn one they move more into the mid board, I move more into the mid board, and I put these guys in reserve. That's fifty points this unit. And then the next turn, I just yeet past the the front line of scrimmage, if you will. Now mm-hmm. I'm into the backfield. I think there's a little bit more there for these guys. I prefer these guys. I think these guys have got some actual play because I don't think the Spider Riders, I don't think you're going to get there, but I think these guys, you're going to move right up the board. Uh, and then again, I guess it's like, okay, well, then what do they do when they get there? Um, <laughs> just have the best time, buddy. Just <laughs> <laughs> They're just loping around on some giant doggies. Like, that's fun. Well, you could put, um, a, you could put a boss in there, right? Goblin boss, yep. like you can, I know they can deliver something of use. Uh, uh, back although, there. although, is that the same problem? And they don't then have reserve move on that. So the guy wouldn't have reserve move. Yeah, but they would. So he could, as long as he starts at the front of the unit, they could. I, I don't know. No, I don't, I don't know, think man. so. But I, you yeah. could. You, this could be something because it's so cheap. You could sneak these guys around. I think. Like, sure. That, that, and they're going to be a very low priority target. Um. The, their issue again, as always, is impetuous. Um, and also, it, it, like when they get into combat, I don't know if they're killing anything ever. No, that's no. not a problem. These guys should be redirectors in chaff. Fifty points, a million move, all that kind of stuff. Again, at fifty points, and with impetuous, is a turn or two of being in the way enough before they charge off and kill themselves. Well, and as Maybe. Been, as has been pointed out, they're also skirmishers, so they have three sixty line of sight. So there's no way to yeah. control. Well, like they're going to try and charge everything, basically. Well, I would, I would, yeah, that's why I would definitely have them in open order because <clears throat> that could also provide you the opportunity to, you know, align them away from a lot of things that they might get into trouble with. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily have them in skirmish mode. Um, and, you know, for redirectors, if they have skirmisher and open order, a lot of times I'm putting them in open order just because, you know, you get that free pivot at the end. It allows you to actually redirect things. Um, skirmishers they just form up with the unit that's charging them <clears throat> well so listen that's our core i'm pretty certain let me just check this out yeah that's good everything else is like uh if you can we've covered night goblin mobs uh and we haven't yet done black hawks which are in special so we're just going to jump into special now because this is have everything mm-hmm. that we need and then the big hitters the black hawk mobs kind of feels yeah. like the book is written around these guys and yeah, also, they, yeah by default by yeah. default because of yeah 
So before the orcs used to have animosity, <clears throat> which was annoying as hell, which basically on a, you would roll anything that had animosity, which was most units, you would roll a D six and on a one, they like would beat each other up or they would just squat. They would, there were a couple different results, but you know, ultimately you did have some control over the army. And a lot of times the result was they would actually just sort of move forward anyway. Yeah. Um, but now, and so black orcs would quell uh, animosity. That was their old, that was their old rule. Now, because it's uh, animosity was entirely replaced with impetuosity, which is on a four up, they're just charging off. It's a lot more of a, it's a bigger downside, which makes the black orcs who do not suffer that and also cure it kind of almost like a, it's really hard to not have, feel like you have to have at least a unit of them. A couple things I want to call out about black orcs too um just as quickly as possible is they have motley crew which is really really awesome because yeah. they also have the opportunity to have mixed armor values and mixed weapons um specifically in the front rank uh essentially when you're in combat you use the majority armor save um in the front rank and um so that would be um if you had uh, say my my unit for example there's my front rank is usually eight wide so I could have three great weapons in there who don't have a shield and would have a four up save, but because the majority of the front rank is um, a hand weapon and shield, that means they actually get a three up save in combat. So they're very tough, um, yeah, and they so still just, have punch because they start they start with full plate. We should just point yeah, that out. Start with but... full plate, and you give them a give, and then you give them the majority of the the unit the the shield. Um, you know, obviously the magic banner I use on these guys, because again, economies of scale, as you like to say, um, you can get a lot of bang for your buck there. Is that the wrong um, thing? If, no, if I think it's the economies of scale every time you've been cringing no, inside. Of, no, 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 you're absolutely correct. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you're, you're getting, you're amplifying the effect by, you know, investing it in something that's either more expensive, you know, um, or larger, um, you know, you're just getting more out of, out of those things. Um. They also have the opportunity to have stubborn or a veteran. I, th- I like I like stubborn. I don't like veteran. I don't care about veteran. I, I think I'm wrong to not have found a way to put stubborn on these guys, to be quite frank, but I haven't found a way to put stubborn on them. I think I've already been in a couple of on the table situations where I'm like, fuck, I wish I had stubborn. <laughs> uh, but in but in my mind's eye, they're just never breaking. They're never falling back. But it turns out that that can totally happen all the time. Um, so yeah, it's just a really solid unit. Expensive, 12 points per model. Um, but you know, for the fact they have the armor, they've, they're already big ones. They've got the, uh, plus one weapon skill and plus one strength. Um, you know, they can have great weapons, um, that also come with no downside because of the Motley crew rule. They quell impetuosity. So they help solve, um, the problems that a lot of other units can have. Um, they're just awesome. And yeah. choppers. They also have choppers. Yeah, they have choppers as well. Yeah, they could definitely do a, a lot of hurt. I don't know. Like one of the things about him is the one attack. Like, have you found that? Like, that's been fine. People haven't got rid well, of. They... Yeah, they've got furious charge though. So if they do make the charge, and and if you do set it up so that they are the ones making the charge, they have two attacks. And these guys with two attacks is a bucket of attacks. It's yeah. really good. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Like. For me, like I'm a little bit obsessed with this movement slash times initiative conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. when I look at these units at the moment, because I see initiative three and I'm like, okay, initiative six on the charge, which I want because I have furious charge. So, like, mm-hmm. if anything, I'm doing a lot on the table, like, assuming I'm not just taking five black orcs as attacks, assuming mm-hmm. I'm creating a black orc unit. Now I'm like, right, okay, I need to charge because I want to be up at initiative six swinging and also get plus one attack, which kind of makes sense. So then maybe I'll go for an additional hand weapon. Great weapons are going to be swinging even on the charge at initiative four. Um, and then who am I swinging into? Like, I think that's Some, right. Something, before, yeah. something mindful of too is that they can take a punch. Like they're, they're not, yes, this is not a unit a that necessarily... It, like this is not a unit that necessarily is going to have its front rank r- wiped if it's getting charged. Like the wrong thing charges it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you know, like your tuned up heavy cab, like things that have the AP and the strength to you know take attack out the number, front row yeah. and attack. Like yes, that's totally like. But that's obviously you're doing your best to not get that matchup. You're trying to get if they are being charged. Um, you're trying hopefully not not getting the, the like absolute teeth. And then again, in my in my battle plan essentially it's i'm debuffing or disrupting which units are even able to move 
or or charge into this unit. You know, like I'm trying to shape things with magic to give them favorable matchups as best I can. Mm. But I think again, my ability to do that will diminish over time. And as that happens, um, you know, they're still just as a you know their basic stats that they bring to the table. They're good. Yeah, right? they're good. They're absolutely good. Yeah, no problem. Full plate and shield because they can just play that other role as well. They can just be like, cool, we're three up armor save. We're still in the way. We're five wide, five deep. I know that's an incredibly expensive unit, but like we're mm -hmm. staying like stubborn. We're here. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's a really decent unit. And then everyone around us is benefiting from quelling that animosity. The interesting part is, is that so far I haven't taken any units that I want to quell animosity on. <laughs> Does that make sense? So far, well, that I, would be well. The, the guys I want hanging out to the left and the right of these black orcs is two big old units of, of of night goblins. That's all I want there, and they don't need to be quelled. Exactly. Right? So, so yeah. Um, I think the quell animosity where that comes in is if you don't go with the lord, uh, like if you don't go with the black orc lord, you go with the black, you go with the orc war boss instead, or another shaman, or whatever you decide to do there, and then you go with a black orc boss as your standard bearer. That guy now can go into a unit that really would benefit from being animosity quelled, like a unit of biggins or something like that. So you could have a unit of black orcs, and then you can have the 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 discount shelf black orcs next door to them in a unit of orc boy biggins with a uh, black orc hero in there with a BSB, and then you know you're getting a cheaper version of black orcs that are still effective and not impetuous. Yeah, I think also, like, yeah, I think there's the opportunity. I don't know. Yeah, there's some very wide frontage on some of these units. I was like picturing two units of of orcs to the side of these two guys. And I'm like, that's just a huge front. Like, absolutely huge. Like, there's no way to guarantee that they're going into the black orcs, not going into the other units. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of, and, and all of those units want to charge to pump up that initiative. Uh, some something you mentioned actually uh, about like going five by five uh, uh like if you just wanted to have just like an like a true anvil like just something that's just going to be like a lot of good static re static res tough to kill tough to shift mm -hmm. these guys are four they're 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 heavy infantry right so they only need four to make a rank yes so you could actually have them as uh you know three by four you could have 12 or maybe you maybe go maybe go four by four you know go 16 have them only four wide and uh, now they're getting, you know, they have a, a rank to to have killed off, and they're still getting their plus two um, rank bonus. So that's that's pretty good stuff. Um, can I just pause for a sec? Yeah, the, we are going to start getting into some really fun stuff moving away from Black Hawks, to be honest, uh, because now we yeah. get into like like tasty, tasty goodness. Uh, and can I mm -hmm. shout out one I like? Yep, uh, I'm going to troll mobs. That's what I want to go to. I want to go to troll mobs because I think the troll and mobs... And these, these are guys who are about to get an army of infamy, as we know. Yes. Um, so they're probably going to get even better. Uh, exactly. Like, and, and I like this. I, like, I kind of settled that river trolls were the best. I think I decided river trolls were the best when I did my overview because um, you've got three different types of troll. Uh, one's got... Uh, the river trolls got more wounds. Uh, they all are initiative one apart from the common trolls initiative two, but it doesn't matter. You're going to be giving them a great weapon anyway, in my personal opinion, which means they're going to be swinging with their three attacks at strength seven, which we love. That's, that's ruthless. Yep. Minus two AP as well. Yep. Yeah. Which I think is good. They've all got armor bane on there as well. Um, uh, the river trolls got regen, but it's flammable, but like, you know, They've got to have the flaming attacks, not necessarily think they're always going to have it. They so get like, the extra wound, right? Yeah, they get the extra wound, which I think makes a lot yeah. of sense for seven points. Uh, eight points, sorry. Uh, so I like the River Troll the most. Um, they've all got stu stupidity, but like I like this as a unit because now, if you're talking about Black Orcs, this is the unit I have at the side. Like someone hits a black orc block or even a night goblin block and the fanatics, then in comes these guys. And it's kind of like they're initiative one. So going to be striking with great weapons. And these are the guys I want to be swinging into other units. This is, I would manage the board. I would not manage the board for a unit of orcs, <laughs> but I would manage the board for a unit of trolls. Right. Like, because they're just going to start ripping through stuff. And that's kind of what I want. And I think they're survivable enough. And then there's that whole kind of ongoing conversation right now about monstrous infantry and monstrous cavalry and how they have great front ranks or fighting ranks because there's a lot of wounds in that front rank which i think is tons of nice. wounds tons of attack density too right like yeah exactly. um, it's just gonna be hard to chew through these guys fast enough uh to you know like eliminate their ability to swing back at a tremendous strength like strength seven's crazy 
like strength seven is stuff that you see on like the best dragons. That's about it, right? Like, like it's 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 not, and it's just a very very high strength in this game. Um, and then on top of that, you know, because it's a great weapon, you got minus two AP, and it's armor, and, and it's going to be armor bane one on these guys. And that's pretty dope. Um, I do, I think I don't mind the stone troll as well because they are a bit, although they lose the wound, um, they do gain a lot of defensive buffs. So they, they, they get a five up, they go to a five up armor save because they have armored hide one. Um, they have uh, magic resistance one uh, on top of the, re- on top of the regen everyone else gets. And they're cheaper uh, by four points than the, than the river troll. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know if over the course of a game, whether or not that, that extra pip of armor and magic res may or may not. I mean, depending on match, it might actually wind up being particularly useful. Um, over the additional wound. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I would bet River Trolls probably just wounds are better. I, I, I could see that. Like, I think, I think, I think the, the reason I just like this unit like is because I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, would I? Yeah, if I'm taking four to five trolls, I've committed enough points that I'm starting to look around working around this unit. But the the book, the, the book itself, like with the, the war machines, the book has that width it has the ability for me to be like, cool, I'm just going to have some night gobos, I'm going to have some trolls, I'm going to have some war machines, I'm going to yeet some war machines at you, going to hit you with some fanatics, and I counter charge with these absolute beat sticks. And you're like, okay, that's, that's a lot that I've got to try and unpack before I get over to you, which I think is interesting. And then going forward, then move six. Don't hate that. That's pretty nice. So good. Like, that's uh, good. Under, I- Underrated call out for these guys too is they're on forty millimeter base and their unit size one to nine. So you could drag and ogre these guys, um, especially if you have your if your if your war boss or your general is on the large target. Um, so like on the wyvern, uh, that eighteen inch range is going to help them mitigate their stupidity a lot better than a black orc war boss could mitigate impetuosity. Yeah, he's got a six inch range on that. He's got an eighteen inch range on this. So you could have three dumbasses wandering around in the midfield as your <laughs> redirectors, and be be reasonably, you know, with it being reasonable for them to survive long enough uh, to, uh, you know, sort of to be close enough to them that they're, you know, got a good chance of passing those stupidity checks. Because obviously, stupidity checks right now, there's no access to a way to reroll it. Uh, you know, you can't reroll it with the with the BSB like you used to be able to. So, like, stupidity is a real problem for these guys. Uh, but so you need they need to be babysat by the general at this point. <clears throat> but also, like, uh, unlike all the points you just made are great. Like, because like, like unlike impetuosity, you're going to be able to like manage this a little bit better with the the stupidity mm-hmm. thanks to that, which I think is fun. I love the ideas of solo ones. You know, we're looking at like fifty point spider riders. Because like a solo one is a redirector. A solo one though is also like a flank charger at the right situation, like into like with some decent output, which is really nice as well. Disrupt ranks, little solo ones, and it's a really low cost, fifty points. Uh, well, actually, if you're taking a great weapon, it's slightly more. It's like fifty four points as you redirect. So it's literally a comparison of one for one, pretty much, with those little fast cav units we talked about a moment ago. And I think I love it. Like I love them. I think they're great. So I like. Mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily that sure they make it into any lists ever, but I see. Like so I keep looking at them in, in Warriors of Chaos as well. Tr- like just trolls generally. And I'm like they mm-hmm. swing like a mountain. Like, yeah, this is good. So they sure do seem good. Like I get like if if you're going like again if you're going with that Night Goblin uh, theme and you don't want to bring uh, Black Orcs into it. Uh, well, then there's a really great situation where your center block becomes trolls. Something handy to a to a general, uh, you know, sitting at leadership nine or ten, um, in in one of the the night goblin units adjacent to the the trolls who now become that center block. That's really tough to shift. That's going to deal a ton of 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 pain. Uh, you know, like that's that sounds good to me. Uh, I think trolls. I think trolls could totally be good. But again, they do require uh, work to make good. But I think less work than a lot of the other options in this in this book. So but the reward I, at the I, end is great. Like, uh, yes. like the, yeah, the, absolutely. The, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing bad. Like, even if they do just stumble forward like zombies every turn until they get contacted by somebody, they're going to kill whatever the, like, or they're going to hurt at least anything that they wind up, you know, in base to base with. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And also, I think, uh, you like when you have certain units, like your opponent only has like, like your opponent has to look at their units and be like, right, what have I got that's going to deal with the troll unit? 
mm -hmm. then you now know that your opponent needs that that unit of theirs to go into your unit of uh, of thingy. And similarly, you should be trying to put your troll unit into something of value, like in theirs. But like you're creating a problem. Do they have loner? They don't have loner. They don't have loner. They're monstrous infantry. Can you make any monstrous infantry? No. Can you combine? Could you just put a character with the trolls? No. They need to have the monstrous infantry keyword. Similar, like heavy infantry could only go in heavy infantry and light infantry and light infantry units. Okay. So that that's a kind of like uh, a thing. I think that. I, oh yeah, you I, have to be the same subtype. That's right. You have to be the same subtype. This is why I couldn't. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 All right. This is that why happens. I couldn't put a black orc. I couldn't put a black orc into a uh, into a uh, wolf rider group uh, because he's heavy. He's heavy cab, and they're light cab. Yeah, same uh, as I can't put wanna... a chaos sorcerer lord in a skirmish unit of marauders. So, um, so who do we want to? Uh, who else do we want to touch on before we wrap this bad boy up? Oh, the I I know what I'd like to talk. Oh yeah, we got oh this yeah we still got to talk chariots because chariots are interesting, and then I'd love to touch on the squig hoppers and the uh, let's and do the, it. Um, the herders let's do it. so we'll do we, let's do night goblin squeak herds as they're here right so let's do them yes so, so the first list i built all had these guys okay and now they don't okay <laughs> <laughs> the, unit, the unit size unit size is a five regular infantry and it's broken up into squig herders and squigs uh you get two attacks from the actual squig itself at strength five uh, mm -hmm. which is pretty certain. And it's huge gobs. It's got its own profile, which is Minus five AP. AP one, and it's got armor bane. Um, yep. uh, armor bane one, yeah. And then uh, they're a skirmish unit. They're a warband unit, so you could get them. They start leadership six with a herder. What, do, what did you like about this unit, and now what don't you like about this unit? I like them because they seem like a great go out there and, and, and fight someone unit. And I think um, I realized that I wanted more control. And by the way, they're the only Night Goblin option that's impetuous. Um, so, uh, you know, they kind of got into situations that I didn't like them in as much. And also, you need a pretty big spend to make a unit big enough that, they're, that, that sort of justifies it. However, again, in a Night Goblin-themed army, I think they're really great as flankers or just something to pressure on the outside. Um, not necessarily as a, as a core unit, um, and you know maybe messing around with like you know ten or I don't know ten or fifteen or something like so you can have a, a wide enough like a wide enough frontage to like really threaten because they're mean like they're strength five AP negative one armor bane, um, you know uh, they they are suffering from um, I guess a fairly low initiative but you know on the charge they're pretty good. Um, but anyway, I think they're not a bad unit. Again, like they're really close to being something that I was running, and I want them want to use them more because I love them. Uh, but uh, I feel like again, this is probably something that they're, they're basically. I, I think night goblins and fanatics are better. <laughs> is is where I get to with these guys. That makes a lot of sense. I think like little small. You could take incredibly small units of these, right, and just use them. I see them as again night goblins deep. Someone charge them, stick there for a bit. These guys go in the side. Um, you're looking at breaking ranks, breaking units, running them down. Big bricks of these I can't see, which is nice because I don't really want to paint 36 of these guys up or whatever. <laughs> like, you know, this is fine. Which but well, again I already have 40, Rob, so well, great. But bro, being able to like bro, being able to just be like, do you know what? I what is a unit of five? Like uh 53 points. Being able to just be like I played a game last night. I want to mix up a little bit, take out a couple of units, drop in some five man squads of these, and try to develop sure. your micro. Is like that's a lot of tech for orcs and goblins. So best in slot for tech micro, we're about to go to. Okay, where are we going? We're going to the squeak hoppers. Okay, All right, squeak hoppers. I'll go find them. You you start telling me what you like about them. So first, number one thing, number one best thing, they're random movers. So they m randomly move 3D6, and they're one of two random move movement units that I absolutely love. The other one's the Mangler Squig. Um, they have, on the the Bowder Squigs that the Squig Hoppers ride on are the exact same profile as the Squig Herd, because they're just riding the Squig, squig guys. Um, and because random movers now um, are able to basically, like you can't declare a charge reaction against them, um, they also don't have impetuosity because they can't declare charges. So that's wonderful. Um, they uh, so they have enough teeth. Uh, 
uh, to do something if they do wind up in combat. <laughs> but more importantly, I have them on the, I have them usually in skirmish formation on my extreme flanks to zone out scouts to, um, you know, maybe wrap around and like just be annoying, just be something that has to be accounted for to other chaff. Because if these guys randomly charge into other chaff, they're going to eat them. Uh, and a minimum unit of them is 71 points or so with the boss. Um, so it'd be 60. Yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. So I, I give them cavalry spears and I give them a boss. Um, so they, I think they come out to 71 points. So they're just very, I think, good value, great, useful tools. You could also put them in open order and run them as more of a traditional redirector. Because again, they don't have impetuous. So you can just move them out and give them their pivot so that you can actually do a, a traditional redirect with them. I find them very, 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 very um, useful. And also, I never had a chance to use Quick Hoppers in all of 8th edition because they were complete, complete garbage. Uh, and so it's nice that they're useful now. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens with the, the rumored FAQ that's supposed to come this month or sometime soon For random movers. Uh, because random movers, I think, will get adjusted. I think... The biggest thing that I would think that will happen with random movers is you're not going to be allowed to do the sort of like wraparound charge. So, you know, start in a front arc and wind up charging from the flank or the rear, which is something you could do by the rules right now. I suspect you won't be able to do that. Um, but I'm hoping that they keep the freedom of movement that random movers currently have. So basically you roll their, you roll their distance and you can use that movement however you want. I hope, they, I hope that stays. If that stays, these guys remain very good. Yeah, because I I think like these are you know you've got three units really now fitting in that like solo trolls these guys you know uh, I know these guys are, are probably the much better version of all of them but like you're able to in this army have very small units that are wound dense not wound dense um, that are like attacks dense really for how small they are profile wise on the tabletop mm -hmm. and then where they're able to go and these have got the most mobility option which feels great. Um, yeah, and like these scare me a little bit because, like, especially playing like very low uh, model density warriors of chaos, I'm like, go away! Like, <laughs> I yeah. can't, I can't engage with a block of night goblins and all of the other stuff that you've got knocking around at the time. Don't have any small arms fire, uh, you know, and like you don't really care about losing seventy points over time. All of the multiple seventies will stack up, but like these are really good. Really, really good. I could definitely see this. All right. Um, um, go on. Touch on chariots? Yes, definitely touch on chariots. So we've got a couple of different types of chariots. We've got Snotlin Pub Wankens, uh, Wolf Chariots, and then Orc Boar Chariots as well. So go look at those. Uh, so, I mean, the Snotlin Pump Wagon is obviously excellent because it's got, it's so unique, you know, really for what it brings to the table. Is it good? I don't think so, but... <laughs> I don't know if this is good. And and I'm confused about the chariots in general. I don't I, I haven't used them. The chariot I use is a mango squig. Um like I, I prefer the mango squig because it's rugged random move, not impetuous. Uh but I do feel like the chariots are plausibly good. Um, you know, you can you can tune them up too to have extra crew so that they actually have, you know, even more attacks in combat and stuff. Um I like that you can make Savage Orc chariots now. That's kind of a fun hobby opportunity. I think chariots. Um, I think chariots are going to be a little bit more defining in the game than we like. Like initially, I mean, because it's because what we're really talking about with chariots is like adding to combat res. I think is the main point, and in some cases, pretty tough to get rid of. Like an board chariot is ninety points, and it's got toughness five, four wounds, and a four up armor save. So it's like yeah, tough-ish to get rid of. Uh, so yeah, it's you not know, bad. So you could kind of go past the. Are we saying like a redirector around fifty points is about what you want to pay? If you're going up to like the 90 point yeah. mark, then you've got a redirector that's also going to do something a little bit. Like it's going to push yes. through push through an enemy like screen or chaff. Then it's there. It's in the way. Uh, it's impetuous, which is obviously the big problem on the old board chariot. Um, but mm -hmm. D6 plus one impact hits. It's decent. Uh, strength five. AP two. It's good. Yeah. It's good. I it's mean, good. it's, it's uh, not a fanatic, I, but it's good. Pardon me. I, I think the um, I think the uh, number one comparison to this guy is the Mangler. So, like um, for my money, the Mangler uh, is uh, strength six, toughness five, random mover three d six. So obviously isn't quite as 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 zippy as this guy is, but he can still haul ass. Um, like he's still very, and you can use magic to move him around as well. Um, and uh, the difference being, though, that he then gets D6, Strength 5, Killing Blow, negative 2 hits in combat, and D3, 
strength six, negative two stomps after combat. Yeah, um, and he's, just, five he's points a star. Four. Yeah, he's a star, right? Like absolute star of manglers. Are you? Uh, how do you feel about running two at the moment? I I do run two. Yeah, um, okay. so they so the manglers actually fill the redirector role. True. God damn it. <laughs> to me, feel fill right now the redirector role because they move like a chariot. They're behemoth, so they have to pivot and stuff. They they move like a close order formation. Um, but they um, so they're redirectors. But just like you said right there, like you want a redirector to be about 50 points. If it's more than 50 points, it's got to be able to do stuff. Mango Squeeze are a threat to just be, just about anything in the game. It's strength six with a potential, you know, 15 attacks, um, you know, that, that are landing at like high AP. Like it's, it's, it's a gnarly, it's a gnarly thing. I, I really, really do enjoy yeah, the Mangler. I, yeah, you it's can a also good point. do nothing. Yeah, why would you, you ever take a chariot? Sorry, sorry. I was just saying, why would you ever do that? Well, because chariots are cool. Yeah, but this is cool. Um, and, yeah, he's pretty cool. I mean, you could also do both. I mean, there's definitely room for both. Um, just but, full send. Uh, th- yeah, just full send. I think this that's not a not a bad call. Um, but I think for the like the unique role that they have, like they're 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 they have I think heavy armor. If I'm not yes, so they've got skin counts as heavy armor. Um, so you know they've got a five up instead of the four up. Um, but they again they just they're just so. Again, if if they just wind up being a redirect, great. If they just wind up getting filled with arrows and die immediately, yeah, all right, ninety five points. I wish, it, I always want them to make contact with something. But if they don't, it's not like it's not the end of my world. And they're always a problem. So like, they're always something that the enemy has got to be like, okay, I gotta I gotta allocate something to deal with these guys, even if it's not particularly hard to deal with them. Um, they're just they're a lot of pressure, and they're the, almost the exact same points as that as that chariot. I think the difference between the this and the orc chariot is obviously the orc chariot's a lot faster, reliably faster. But again, at three d six, I mean he's moving nine ish inches a turn. I can use magic to move him further along. I can give him earthen rampart, which gives him um, a five up ward save uh, out of elementalism, and also um, uh, anyone who charges him counts as disordered because um, not disordered as uh, the other one. Uh, they lose their initiative bonus. Disrupted. Oh no, disorder was right. Sorry, uh, because it counts as defending a low linear obstacle. Normally, you can't march or charge, but guess what? He's a random mover. You can't march or charge anyway. Um, so uh, you know that's that's a nice little piece of a uh, uh, nice little combo I like to use to give him some survivability and still maintain his threat. So I just love the mangler. I, I think he's a, he's a highlight. I would put him ahead of the chariots, but I could also see the chariots being fun and perfectly decent as well. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's definitely an opportunity to think about a list that is because a good conversation like we've been having through most of this show is about initiative values, initiative three uh, on the charge, initiative six. So it doesn't charge, so it'll never change, right? It'll never go up to six because does it count as charging when he moves? It into counts combat? as charging when okay, he gets so, into combat. Okay. Uh, so I have been playing that where he gets the initiative bonus. Okay, um, all right, that's fair. Yeah. Um, but like, my point is, is like, especially impact hits being pointed out in the chat, and I think it's a really fair point. Impact hits are done at initiative step ten. Uh, therefore, mm. you're beating up elves, which is nice, which are normally very lightly armored uh, in most cases. And so, being able to hit before them, there's definitely that situation as well, where these guys plus some chariots. You're looking at a couple of elves across the line. These guys are going to thunder into them uh, and then they're going to swing before them. And you're then going to defeat that. You're in a really nice position there. Just imagine the the orc block we talked about previously. And we made them frenzy, give them additional hand weapons, let's say. And then what we do is we just send some chariots in first. They wipe out the front rank. It's great. So now our low initiative guys, they're then going to get all of their attacks. And then we're kind mm-hmm. of snowballing that combat which feels really, really nice. So I think chariots will have more of a like a, a position in the initiative battles in some cases. Um, that's, a good, so, that's a really good use of them. And also, like you mentioned, coming in the side and, and disrupting things. He can't disrupt because he's only four wounds, uh, okay. but a chariot can. Um, uh, that's actually a good thing. I, I've actually never noticed that. So he would not be able to take away rank bonuses, for example. Um, but, uh, he's also just eating a bunch of shit and killing a bunch of guys. So that's, that's fun. And a lot of times he he will do nothing aside from, again, being that heavy pressure. Um, and also, uh, a unit that, you know, needs to be dealt with in some realm. It, maybe it's a magic missile. Maybe it's just some archers that take him down. Um, but he does need to be dealt with. Otherwise he will go eat, eat somebody. 
Yeah. Uh, someone's asked in the chat what a redirect unit is. We keep using that a lot. Effectively, it's, oh, sure. a, it's a unit that um, you put in front of an enemy unit. So when that they charge, they have to close the gap at a particular angle, which is an angle that's detrimental to the position that they want to go. So imagine they want to go in a straight line, straight towards your unit, and then you position your unit so that when they connect with it, it's 45 degrees away from the unit, that, like the straight line they're trying to go towards. Uh, now, obviously, you get reforms and stuff, depending on the right how combat go and other things but that's effectively what they're doing so it's screening is just stopping stuff zoning is creating a space where people can't land inside of and then redirecting is is literally making them move in a direction they don't want to do because of how closing gaps and movement trays work uh so you, yeah yeah i would say too like if you think of it as most units in fantasy or, or old world as being on rails so they kind of like have to go in sort of a wheelie like straight line direction it's like changing the the uh, like they get to that fork of the tracks and you like hit the switch and they have to go down this way instead of this way. It can pull units. They're used for pulling units out of position and, and doing the things Rob just said. So, um, but that's largely because of the unique way that movement works in, in the rank and flag style. So anyone more, else we want to highlight? Just, just two, just two, just two more units. Just th that's all we got all right. left. Uh, and that is our big fellas. We've got the giant and the Arachnorok spider. That's oh all Yeah. Got. So the giant and the Arachnorok spider. Now, giant's interesting. Giant in, is it can be in several different armies. Um, it's got a really fun series of attacks. It's toughness six, six wounds, but like it's two hundred points. Two hundred points is pretty cheap. But if you're spending two hundred points, do it to a mount for a character who then can give him a ward save and a regen save and a high armor value and. Isn't or if he's just a chaos giant and just has those things, yeah. or can take those things, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the the giants are kind of like just they are really fun and potentially maybe good. But yeah, they're not awful. I, I don't think I don't think they're I don't think they're there's something that you have to like be ashamed of taking anymore. Like before, it was like I'm taking a giant and I'd like just shut up, okay? I'm just taking the giant. But now it's like I like I've wound up in combats with giants being like, <laughs> look at this dumb giant, and then be like, oh shit, um, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's just a little bit different now than it used to be. Um, they, they're still vulnerable to weight of attacks because they don't have a really good save, but they do have some form of a save at least. Um, but you know, they have, you know, the stomp attacks, uh, they're behemoths. So that's, you know, um, the stomp attacks just, is good. They, that gives you a regular they, combat output, right? The DC exactly, stomps. Yeah. Yeah. Unbreakable was great about them. Terror causing, um, the never do pick up and I don't understand how those rules made it past anything because uh, they literally don't work really at all. Um, but the uh, regular giant attack table, there's some really cool ones in there, well worth uh, taking a roll on. And he can just he can just he just can just mess some stuff up. Um, he's great. Yeah, I, like I would him. I would uh, argue I would argue that like he's definitely like more like a fun position than anything else. Uh, but like legit, I think you could lose some fights to a giant and you would be pissed. So, but yeah. survivability is an issue. Survivability is an issue, definitely. Yes. Um, the finally, Arachnorok yeah. is I really want I haven't I haven't I I desperately want to like find ways to to make use of him. Um I really love how big his base is. Um is pretty cool. Like, I like the lobber putting, and the spell. I like the lobber and the spell. That's what I'm gonna say. What's, go ahead. So D3 explain toughness. The and the spell. D three toughness, minus D three toughness. Mm -hmm. Right, then I throw my five inch template on it and it's strength two around and there's strength four in the middle. But if I take you from you know, if I take you from toughness four to toughness one, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm wounding a lot of boys. Uh, it's a couple it's Could a two, it's a combo I have to make happen, so it's not the best, of course, but it's a big range. Uh but it's expensive. Three hundred and ten points, seven wounds, toughness six. Um he has an armor of four plus, which is actually I think decent. Yeah, like, it's not bad. It's not bad. I just don't get why. I don't understand why. He's also how to instead of instead of being a mounted thing. Um and I think that sort of changes how like if I were to put like a you know a better armor on my a guy who I mount on on this thing. I, I don't know how that ex exactly interacts, so I'd be I'd, I'd have to look at that carefully. But how to is different than like a regular mounted creature. Um yeah, I just it, mostly it's the points, three hundred ten points, man. And like, um, what are you getting for those three hundred ten points? You're getting a really big base, 
Um, you're getting some kind of what's this? What's this attack? Oh, minus two AP. Yeah, and six attacks, and then D6 stomp. So you can uh, you can put up to twelve into an enemy unit. Weapon skill four. Um, but that's not bad. Terror, which I think that's the other thing about to say about this list, like susceptible to terror very much. So, uh, so having some terror in your army doesn't hurt. Uh, oh, he actually has no AP on most of his attacks. But he's, uh, yeah, he which has. I which I found really odd. But he has poison, and I'm like, okay. But he's a monster. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, but he does okay. have poison attacks. All right. Yeah, so his wounding is not the problem necessarily. I guess. Oh, there's only strength five. I don't know. I, I think I think there's play with him. Again, is he super good? He's just very expensive. So is what very what can expensive. go on? To, what can go on to an Arachnorok? Is it just the goblin? Can the goblin war boss go on him? No, it's just. Or is it just the uh, the shaman? It's the shaman. Yes, I'm pretty certain it's just the shaman. Uh, character mounts. Uh, it's just the oh, it's the odd knob or the odd git is all it is. But not the night so, yeah, the, one. No, the, definitely. Yeah, no, it's the so it's just the forest guys. So, um, I mean, you end up okay. with a very, a very. Oh no, he's a howder. He's not a plus wounds. I was going to say he's not that survivable. Okay. I think it's still. I think it's still combined somehow. Again, I'm just not familiar enough with it to, to know how it exactly cleaves. Basically, it's more like being a a character on a ridden chariot. I guess. Um, I think they do combine their their wounds, but. Um, so it's still a lot of wounds. I, th I think like having like a uh, like an elemental or actually to be honest with you, a wa um, sh uh, goblin shaman on him would be fun because again, there's this area of effect um, spells in in that lore. Um, I don't know. I think it'd be pretty good. So you can add it the character's wounds to it, and it gets 360 degree vision. So it's like a chariot, basically. Yes. So you can okay. have you yeah. can have a very survivable goblin wizard. Sure. At, is, with a big, big, big footprint for area of effect stuff. So maybe but, for wall magic. Yeah, but I think there's a problem with that, though, in that you then want that wizard in combat because you spent 310 points on having him in combat. So I think the, like, I feel like it's a bit of a waste, personally. Well, there's more range self, again, as long as you have something to deal with the dispel side of it, there's 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 more range self stuff in wall magic. Maybe it's one or two. I think it's at least two. There's at least two range self options in wall magic that are decent. Um, but one is here we go, which is to a, a buff to charging, and then the other one is um, like a reroll to hit or something like that. So anyway, uh, I don't think it's a completely no. It's going to be again one of those models where if you want to get it in your army, you're going to have to like work to figure out how to make it useful. So uh, that might be stuff. so that, ladies and gentlemen, is our first ever deep dive of uh, of an army book. I think it was good. I think it was good. It was nice. Good chat. Uh, yep. Deep dive. Deep dive. Uh, how did My you eyes feel like they're bleeding? We both look worse for wear after that. I think we're a bit haggard. Uh, well, we entered we it. Our best. We entered haggard. So let's remember, uh, like a yes. night goblin, impetuous, not impetuous. So uh, <laughs> TLDR, TLDR. I think there's. I think this is an incredibly wide book that has yes. a lot of options. There's a lot of options. I think it has some very you've gone incredibly glaring, loud. Best... Please stop. Please stop. Don't know what you've done, but you're now so so loud. Why am I so loud? Maybe Don't... I just moved my mic. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. I have a or maybe you know what? Maybe I have a loose connection because I did touch it. Okay. Maybe that's what's up. Maybe maybe my connection uh, comes in and out, and that's why my volume changes. Okay. Well, but like, it's fine now. It's fine now. So yeah, like TLDR, um, a pretty pretty interesting book. Really wide. Loads of different builds. Obviously, Val is very focused right now on like. A certain element, but like you could see the the cogs turning is thinking about different builds as well. I think you've got. I know that there's. We've obviously got the arcane journals and stuff coming out, but you've got years of play in this book. So many units that can swap in and out. Yeah, and I think if as soon as the meta gets super boring, I think the thing to do with it, uh, like as in like there's like a list or like a, an archetype, which right now is probably night goblins and like night goblins and black orcs. That's probably it. Um, so like, I think if that starts to get tiresome, I think you can just delete those entries from the book and then you still have an army that you can figure out and have fun with and like find cool things to do with. So I think like once, once like, if you're like a passionate orc and goblin player and you're like, I don't like what the, like the obvious choices are, tie one hand behind your back. And I still think you can build interesting and fun armies, um, that sort of lean into some of the disadvantages while still being pretty cool. So I, yeah, I, I really love orc and goblins. Yeah, you've got great anti-magic. You've got good, a good magic, good anti-magic, mm -hmm. uh, big hitters, unique. You, like, you have a unique meta problem. 
Like when you're playing a, a tournament, sure, I have to write down how do I kill a Chaos Dragon or control a Chaos Dragon, which we talked about last week. But, yeah. you know, now it's also like, what am I going to do against Fanatics? Like, genuine <laughs> yeah. question. What am I going to do against bricks of Night Goblins that aren't going to shift? What am I going to do? You're the problem, <laughs> I, Val. A genuine question is, what are you going to do against Night Goblin Fanatics? Like, what? Okay. Shit, I think it's kind of like hope he rolls a double. I don't know. Especially like, what do you? What? Do, <laughs> what? Do, what, do, what have you seen? Or is there any way you're, you've been using them? Give me some. Give me some. Give me some hot tips, okay? For our eventual match, give me some hot tips. I don't have to use them. So like, <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> like, I don't. I don't have a good answer to you. Maybe this was. We could reach out to to the YouTube. Uh, like thugs. Get, like, uh, yeah, like in, in the comments, how do you how do you how do you deal with fanatics? Because it's a really tough conundrum. I guess making sure that they are are not presented with particularly tasty morsels for them to just pick up, um, you know, like that would be a, a good play. But it's hard to like even if you do get into combat with them and I didn't release them, well, now I can release them because I can release them from combat. There's another one. They they are another thing that I think need to be chilled out a little bit FAQ wise because. Again, doing like why not do as many units as possible, like of fanatics? Like, why why would that be bad to just only have night goblins and fanatics as much as possible, and then mix in some other things to taste? I, that could just be something that just like literally turns the opponent into a bunch of pink mist, and then, <laughs> and then it just picks up their army, right? Like, if you had all those little min max units of them, or even not particularly min max. I, I mean, don't have a good answer against fanatics, and also I don't want to give you one because uh, I need them to be good for like two and a half more weeks. I think having missile units be able to hit them, even if they just hit them on sixes, I think being untargetable is nonsense behavior. Like even a magic missile, you just be like, "Cool, you're only hitting one." Like I do a fireball, I'm doing two d six hits, but to a fanatic, I feel like it's a fine thing. Uh, yeah. And to not and being able to release them in while I'm in combat, like if, at least if you could find a way to lock me in combat, and then not release them would be good. Um, terrain does help, like hiding behind pieces of terrain, or like even if you're just standing in a forest, you're you're invulnerable to them because they they can't touch terrain. So that's something. So if you're on any sort of a terrain piece, you are invulnerable to fanatics. So that's nice. Um, that is but nice. yeah, there is definitely that is a good tip. Th- th- there, there is some, uh, there is definitely some room to maybe tighten. Like, not don't don't gut them because I'll, I hope they don't get gutted. But like, I like the flexibility of being able to release them when you want, um, and uh, and I would like to see them maybe not able to do certain things. Like, maybe I can't release them while I'm in combat, for example. Because right now, there's no way to not get value from them. Like, it's like you can't kill my unit before I can use them. You know what I mean? Like, it's I'm gonna get to release them. Good. So. Hey, this has been great. Uh, it's a three-hour deep dive. So, chat, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, everyone listening to this as a podcast or as a YouTube show, uh, please leave comments and subscribe. And also just join Patreon for supporting a three-hour deep dive. Come on. Sort your oh. shit out. And uh, for all those who have joined, because I'm there's just constantly people joining up and joining, hopping into the Discord. I hope you guys are enjoying the conversations there. There's a there's a channel that'll match your interests and the conversations have all been great and a really supportive community too, which has been super awesome to see. Yeah. My favorite place to go and chat about the old world. So I took I you away it's... from the, uh, Facebook. That's my that's my greatest it success. Is. That's my greatest yeah, success. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been it's been great. So yeah. Thanks everyone on Patreon. You make my you make my day. And the and the YouTube comments. So uh, YouTube comments are great. Off. Yeah, yeah. Loads. Uh anyway, thanks very much. Orcs and Goblins, let us know what you think. See you in the future. Thanks for being Squarebase. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.